kid. All right, guys, we're here with Dave Kaufman from Dave Kaufman's Reptiles Adventure. How's it going, guys? Herper's TV, Herper's the movie. Uh, yeah. He's just a regular rock star. So yeah. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, take it away, other Dave. <laughs> oh, Dave, to do it? I'm talking about Dave. Um, <laughs> Your well, other Dave. He's yeah. your other Dave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's just get right into it. Um, I want to hear more about the Australia trip. Can we get a little? Yep. Uh, yeah, what yeah. happened there? So we went. I mean, this was like I don't even know where to begin because we went like two weeks after I got back from Thailand. So I was still suffering from jet lag from Thailand. Got yeah, on yet another plane, flew back across the ocean, and by the time that we hit Darwin, I was just beyond exhausted and we were um but you know you got that adrenaline going that you're in a new place and you're looking for new herps and you know that was the only thing keeping me going but you know brian and i that first night out there we crashed hard and our friends that we were with they stopped and went to this cave to look for olive pythons they could not wake us up brian and i were completely crashed out in the back of this van they walk, and it took them hours. They walked all the way to this cave, found a, an olive python, took photos of it, came back, drove to a place, I don't know, two hours down the road. We parked for the night, and Brian and I woke up the next morning. We didn't believe that they actually stopped and went herping and that we had crashed that hard. So the trip kind of got started off, you know, with us just being just dead exhausted. But uh, anyway, it, it, was, it was really weird because when I – plan these trips, I sit there and I say, okay, I have my calendar, my uploads and what I want, you know, to make and what videos I, I want to produce, what videos I think that, you know, the rattlers out there want to see. And I was just going to do like a series of in the wild videos of blackhead pythons in the wild and carpet pythons in the wild and, you know, fill in the blank in the wild. And that's all that I was going to shoot. I wasn't going to do like any of these herping videos or anything like that. And we got to Darwin, the weather was beautiful. And as we started heading south to Alice Springs, like hour by hour by hour, the temperature plummeted, it started raining, and it just kind of stayed crappy. And so in the, you know, we didn't find the blackhead pythons, which are common in that area. We didn't, you know, we found uh, a uh, frilled dragon the very last day as we're on the way to the airport. So we found it and there wasn't enough time for me to do a video on that. So oh, essentially, as I'm out there, I'm having to like reinvent what videos I'm going to shoot out there. And I just kind of winged it. So the videos that are up there, they weren't planned. They just were like, all right, I'm going to film what we film and I'm going to film what we see. I want to do knobtail geckos in the wild. Um, we only found one and it just wasn't enough for me to make a whole concise video about it. And then when we did the Ackies in the wild video, you know, I even show in that video that you know, the temperature plummeted. And so mm -hmm. I'm not going to go out there and take, you know, readings and say, hey, this is what the Yankees are out in, because no, they're not. <laughs> so the, the the temperature readings that I was doing was on the one nice day that we had uh, over the entire trip. And so, wow. yeah, I mean, but other than that, I mean, it was it was amazing. Um, you know, we went to a spot to try to find the Owen Pelly Python, which is like the holy grail of pythons for Australia. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Never thought in a million years we'd ever see it because how many times have I been in something's range where I'm like, we've got a range this big and we can only get to this side of its range because the rest of it is too wild. We're not going to see this thing. Mm -hmm. and tonight, Brian and I are sleeping in the back of the van and we are woken up to the entire van just going from, you know, 80 kilometers an hour to dead stop. All the food in the cupboards rush on us. You know, we're hit, you know, like we're hit the head with all this flying food. And we look out the windshield and half of this python is like sticking out from the grass and it's still covering half the road. It was just like wow. the most amazing herpetological discovery of my life. And it was just completely awesome. And so, you know, Brian and I like snapped away, grabbed our cameras, jumped out of the van at this thing. And, you know, we, we film it. We are just, our heads are spinning just from the excitement of finding the snake you know, from being just groggy and not catching up on sleep. 
And so finally, after we're done with it, we watch it crawl across the road back into, you know, wherever it was heading. The next morning we wake up and Brian and I kind of looked at each other. We're like, now did that really happen? Or did we dream that? Or did that really happen? We go back to our cameras and we watch the footage. And yeah, that was just absolutely amazing to not only find an Owen Pelly, but to find like a nine footer. Yeah. Brian definitely, we interviewed him the other day and he was yeah. like, he was like, nobody's ever going to believe us that the right. this wasn't planted. <laughs> right. Exactly. So yeah, but it, it, it happened. It happened, but That's yeah. Awesome. So, you know, I, I, um, it, it's, I, I would like to one of these days go herping like, you know, Dave, we've been talking about me coming down there and not film, but just herp like I used to herp just for the fun of it. You know, these trips are awesome and I don't want to discount that at all, but they're work for me. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of stress and it's a lot of planning and it's a lot of prep and, you know, a lot of other YouTubers, they have a crew. I'm a one man band. You know, I schedule everything. I figure out what I'm going to shoot. You know, I have to make sure that, you know, all my SD cards, all my equipment, all my batteries, everything is ready. Everything is set to go because when you film what we film, you know, you have no idea what you're going to find one second to the next. And if your camera malfunctions, you miss everything. And that happened a couple of times in Thailand. And it's just, I mean, it just devastates you because, you know, like for instance, in Thailand, uh, during the uh, retic video, this retic was just kind of swimming underwater. And so I quick grab my GoPro, stick it in the water, and I'm filming, and all I hear a beep, 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 beep. The GoPro broke. The water got in the GoPro. I missed that oh, entire man. beautiful gimme shot of a retic just swimming <clears throat> underwater. And I was in front of him with the GoPro. It was perfect. So, awesome. man, yeah, wow. it sucked. It sucked. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, some of the some of the things that happen out there that you just, you know, you try to prep and you try to prepare as much as you can, and things like that still happen. So, anyway, it's a bummer. Uh, it <laughs> so your whole full time job now is basically being a YouTuber, right? Right. Yeah. For the people out there that kind of have dreams about that, like when we watch the videos that you're doing, traveling around the world, not only going to shows and collections, but you're also going to all these amazing like wilderness areas, basically yeah. almost an adventure series showing off animals. Like, like what went through, like when you were starting to think about wanting to do that, what snapped in your head that said, because that's super risky, like to say, for the rest of my life, I'm going to try to do this crazy thing that sounds like almost undoable. I, what, I like, bring us, bring me through that process when you're like, yeah, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to travel around the world and I'm take videos. I'm upload them to YouTube. Right. Well, it wasn't like I was going to quit my job and do this. This was an evolution of the job that I was already doing. Okay. And I never, I mean, if somebody ten years ago would have said, "Hey, Dave, chill out, man. This is what you're going to be doing in ten years. You don't need to like." stress out and whatever, like I, you know, do or was, I would have never believed them ever. And so when I, I, I set out to be an independent filmmaker and that was like my goal to do since I was nine years old, I wanted to be a filmmaker. And when you grow up, well, let's just face it. When you grow up without really any money in you know, the suburbs of Minneapolis, like I did, you know, going into an industry where you need millions of dollars to get into the door is mm. extremely difficult. And so what I did was I said, if I'm going to do this, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to sacrifice everything. I'm going to sacrifice everything in my life to make this thing happen. And I said that, you know, as, as, as soon as I make my first movie and can prove to the world what I can do, everything's going to be gravy from there. So I spent, by the time I was serious about it, I spent at least 10 years of eating two pieces of bologna for dinner constantly, night after night after night. One time I actually bought a jar of peanut butter and could actually make peanut butter sandwiches for dinner. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember filming uh, on a film and we were in a bar and I could not even afford, this is absolutely true. I could not even afford to go to the bar and buy a Coke. I did not have $2 to my name to go buy a Coke. And that's 
you know, the sacrifices that I made, made my first movie. And a lot of people don't know this, but my first movie was a horror film called 13 Hours in a Warehouse. I managed to raise $75,000 to make that movie. And we shot it and I released it and it went out through Lionsgate. It was on video all over the world. It went on Redbox locations. Netflix picked it up. It did really well. And for a $75,000 movie, uh, it grossed well over $3 million. Wow. <clears throat> here's, here's the caveat to that, though. And this is what they don't tell you when you are trying to become a filmmaker. I have made a lot of people very, very rich, except <laughs> me. <laughs> so I, out of that $75,000, out of that $3 million, the reality is, is that it was my creation. I made $16,000. That was it. Wow. That was it. And That's so, crazy. yeah. And so I said, okay, so I've made that. Now I want to do a documentary. And that's where Herpers came in because I wanted to make a documentary because all our lives we encounter people that have no idea why we're passionate about reptiles. They have no mm -hmm. idea why we are crazy enough to have rooms, you know, full of snakes and it just, just down the hall there. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and our family members, you know, they always come up and why do you have so many snakes? So I wanted to make a documentary that showed who we were and why we do what we do. And that's where the idea for Herpers came from. Herpers did so well that I made Herpers too. Uh, Herpers didn't do as well as the as Herpers did, which you know happens. But I had footage for Herpers three, so I made Herpers three. That one didn't do as well as Herpers two. The reason was not because of the quality mm -hmm. of the movies, was because at that point everything was switching to streaming. So mm -hmm. not a lot of people were buying DVDs anymore. So it was harder for me to go and 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 sell a fifteen dollar DVD at an expo at the time that Herpers 3 came out than it was just two years earlier with all the other DVDs. So, you know, I had all this footage that I had shot in Australia and uh, Canada and other places, and I was actually going to make Herpers 4, and I was going to call it the global phenomenon to show how Herpers from around the world do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you're going to go raise another $50,000 to make another video, in this market, I don't feel comfortable that I could make that investment back for my investors. So instead of going out there and deliberately screwing my investors, which I simply can't do, um, I decided to take that footage and create Herpers TV on YouTube. And so I just took all that footage from Herpers 4 and just threw it up on YouTube. I had no idea what I was doing. I called it Herpers TV and I was, I was gonna end it there with just those little clips of whatever and then try to figure out what uh, another movie to make. Well, at this point, Netflix had completely taken over. Blockbuster shut their doors. Distributors were not picking up any more independent films. I mean, the whole industry changed overnight. Then I said, well, I got this YouTube channel. I might as well make a go of it because the independent film world is right now kind of dead. And, it's, it, and I didn't see a point of where it was going to come back. And to this day, it hasn't come back. Um, hmm. and so, uh, and so, yeah, so I kind of ran with the YouTube channel and then, uh, Ryan at Zilla saw what I was doing with it and came up and offered to sponsor me. And as soon as he did that, um, that just completely opened the doors because I wasn't going to continue with the YouTube thing at all until Ryan did that. And so Ryan is to thank for everything that I have right now. I mean, hands down he is because I would have quit and just found something else to do if he hadn't come to me and, and, and said, hey, I want to sponsor you. And that opened the door to everything. Wow. So it just kind of evolved from that point. So a lot of people say, you know, Dave, you know, I, you're so lucky. I wish I could do what you do. And I always tell them the truth. I'm like, sacrifice. Sacrifice everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Just sacrifice everything. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> just, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, quit your job. Don't pay your bills. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, <laughs> the point to it is, is that, yeah, it, it did take a lot of sacrifice to get to where I am. And that's, I guess, my convoluted point that I could have said within 30 seconds, but I just made that into a 10 minute speech. That's fine. Uh, we, that's we, we need, need that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, that's great. And, um, you know, one thing, like I always say in this hobby, especially talking to newer people is, you know, it's adapt or die, you know, whether it's the projects you're working with right. the species, and just like you knowing what your next step, you know, had to be, I don't, 
you know, that's awesome. Um, a lot of people would have thrown in the towel at that point. Right. Well, now YouTube is going through it. Now, now the whole online video markets are completely changing. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen in the future, but I'm going to do this for as long as I possibly can. Absolutely. But it is changing. TikTok is... I, I don't know. That's a whole other topic. I don't know if you guys want to hear the TikTok or not, but I'd love to hear I mean, your opinion. <laughs> yeah, I don't know shit about TikToks. So I'd like to hear some TikTok information. So TikTok is. You remember a, 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 a website out there called Vines that was yep. out there for a while ago? Yep. People were making these short videos called Vines, and Vines completely went away. Mm -hmm. um, it, it lost favor. Well, TikTok, I anytime there's a new platform because I have a love hate relationship with YouTube. You know, I, I make my living on YouTube, but I really hate how YouTube is run. Um, and uh, so anytime there's a new platform, I'm always like investigating into it to say, okay, is this where I migrate to in the future? Or is I'm you know, going to stick with YouTube or what, what's going to happen here? So I looked into TikTok. TikTok has exploded right now and they are stealing tons of views away from YouTube. Um, People can sit there and scroll and look through three-second videos instead of having the attention span to sit through and watch a 10, 20-minute video on YouTube. So YouTube is really feeling that hurt right now. Well, the reality of TikTok is, is that, and not a lot of people know this, is that it's a Chinese company. And it's a Chinese company that was created to data mine Americans. Oh, that yep. sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> and they were doing exactly that. And so every time you um, every time you upload or create a uh, an account with TikTok, you are giving the Chinese government a lot of information about you. And it sounds like a conspiracy theory, which I am totally not. I laugh at conspiracy theories, to be honest. But this is true. This is absolutely true. All you need to do is just do a quick Google search and well, find out where TikTok is based, and they are a Chinese data mining company, and we're falling for it. If, so, uh, if you're not a conspiracy theory, theory, um, <laughs> the conspiracy theory you got right here. Um, so, what are the ramifications of me starting a TikTok or TikTok account? Like, what's going to happen to Dave when I give China everything? I don't know <laughs> the answer to that, to be honest. They, you'll see naked pictures of guys riding tacos. Like that's <laughs> that's what's gonna happen. I mean, it does, it. I mean, I that doesn't sound that bad. I can live with that part, but um, I honestly okay. don't. Yeah, I don't think anybody really knows. But when I found that out, and and there's another issue, not just you know that kind of off-putting you know side of it, but as a creator, we should be paid for the work that we do, and. TikTok doesn't pay their creators. So every time you upload a video to those platforms, even Instagram, you are making those companies a lot of money off of your work and we aren't getting a penny for it. And the way that people get paid is in notoriety. And, you know, that's it's not good enough for me. You know, <laughs> if I'm going to create something that, especially if this is what I do for a living, I want to be paid something for that. And the only two companies out there that pay you to make videos is Facebook and, and uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Well, with Facebook, you need 10,000 followers on your page before you can join their partnership program. With YouTube, it's only 1,000. Dang it. We only huh. have 8,000. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering why I'm not getting paid for my videos on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, But it's funny. The two companies that you are getting paid for your content are the two that are falling out of favor the fastest for these other Yeah, platforms. that's true. That's true. I wonder what that leaves for uh, the future. Well, yeah. you know, they're, they're just, where are we? 20? So I think in 17 or 16, uh, Amazon uh, filed a trademark for OpenTube. And the description of that trademark was exactly what YouTube is doing. Hmm. But that was four years ago, and nothing has been said since. But... To be honest, I think that, you know, in talking with other YouTubers and feeling my own frustration with YouTube, that as soon as there is a legitimate competitor to YouTube, there's going to be a massive migration from YouTube to that new platform. Mm. But 
by just, doing so, I mean, you're kind of given a, I mean, you lose all your followers you already have established on YouTube. Is it just kind of hoping for the best? They make their way to this new social online networking. Well, that's, that's the, that's the, 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 the trick. Of it. That's the, yeah, that's the trick. Right. Right. I don't think yeah. YouTube is ever going to go away, you know, and I don't want YouTube to go away, but the way that they deal with their algorithm, the way that um, it's very hard for creators to predict um, what, you know, what video is going to get, you know, the, the highest amount of views. And, and there's all this stuff that goes into it that people don't understand. You know, you're, the name of the video, uh, the description of the video, um, they've made it so that tagging is completely obsolete. They've made it so that subscribers, having subscribers is almost completely obsolete. So the algorithm now um, rewards you for having non-subscribers watch your videos more than your subscribers. Really? Yeah. So it, it doesn't make any sense. So if you're saying um, the key to the whole YouTube thing is having like the right title on your video to get more followers, so yeah, but there, there, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things that the algorithm picks up. So when even when you you know I don't know how you guys well you guys do live videos, but when I edit my videos, I use Premiere Pro. Yep. And so when you export that uh, that footage to you know into an MP4 or an MLV or whatever you use to upload to YouTube. The file name that you name that file should match what you name the video on YouTube. Oh, yep. Otherwise, I don't do that. The That's our channel sucks. Will, no, yeah. It. The other will try to take data from every little point that you give it. Why would it? It, it doesn't make sense it, it of why the meta, metadata on the file. I'm sure it, it's it's, yeah, it's but it doesn't make sense why they would do it that way. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm That's saying. The frustration. Like, Right, like this morning's video, I love this video that I just put up this morning. It's with, you know, Ken and Harkin from Camp Kennan and Brian Cusco, and we're out in Australia, we're joking around. You know, it's a funny video, I thought. And, and I, once I upload a video, I very rarely ever watch it because I've just spent a week editing this thing and I'm so sick and tired of seeing it. This is the type of video that I would go back and watch. Yeah. Well... I thought that this thing was going to be huge. I thought that you know, right off the bat, it was going to be huge. This thing is not doing well at all, at all. Usually by this time of day, so it's now when we're recording this, it's four thirty my time. I upload at eleven o'clock my time, which is nine o'clock Pacific. It should it, it should have several thousand views, and it doesn't. And so then you're left sitting here looking at it, going, "Okay, so what did I do wrong?" Could I have named it something different? Could I have done a different thumbnail? Could I have done this different? Could I have done and you and it kind of puts you into this mode where you backtrack and you're like, okay, this video didn't do well, but I thought that it would. So what am I missing? So it's a constant like back and forth, you know, every time that you create something because there's so much that you have to think about um, that goes into the creation of a video. And the fact that YouTube is rewarding more how well you can sort of discern their algorithm and play to it rather than how good the content actually is. is right. It's right. Really just a sad way to actually run a platform. Well, and now it seems like they are rewarding clickbait. So the more clickbait that you do, the more viewers you do, you get, the more that the algorithm says this is a good video and then starts suggesting that video. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just garbage for like 30 seconds you turn it off. <laughs> wait, 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 right, right. So your 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 you know your your audience attention level is nothing, but you're getting those views and because you're getting those views and if you're getting those views from non-subscribers, the algorithm goes crazy and elevates your video. Hmm. Yes. So, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> you know, I've sat here for what now? Couple minutes bashing YouTube, <laughs> but yeah. well, YouTube's I'm, great. <laughs> I'm, I'm venting my frustrations with it and letting people kind of know, you know, what it takes to be a YouTuber because there are a lot of people out there that you know would love to do a YouTube channel for a living, but they don't really see the behind the the, the scenes of what really goes into making a video until they get deep into it. And then they've wasted a year of their life when they're yeah. like, I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I wasted 30 of mine. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's oh man we had a conversation about that today <laughs> i don't want to get into it but it's yeah, like, yeah. Know, it is depressing <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we start talking about some more animals too yeah like, yeah let's do yeah, yeah. <laughs> animals. um so have you ever herped new jersey no, you know, here, Why are you here, here's the funny thing. So I have been to all 48 states and I will make it to Hawaii and Alaska one of these days and Jersey. I drove like from one little corner of it, took the highway back over to Philadelphia just to say I've been in New Jersey. That's all the time I've ever spent in New Jersey. So I've definitely got to go back And the Pine Barrens are one of like those places in the world that I really want to go hurt. Yeah, I know that we we've talked about that before, and we do uh, we pretty much live in the Pine Barrens. I mean, there's it's not far up the street from where we're at right now. What are we doing this remotely for? We should have been doing. This thing. <laughs> I'm talking about we can go hit up some temper rattlers, man. That's right. Let's do it. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I we will definitely be herping the Pine Barrens one of these days. Yeah, yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah. All right. So, to, what's your what's your number one herping experience? The one memory you're like, this is it. This is holy buckets. <laughs> Terror skink in New Caledonia. That yeah. I actually really enjoyed that series of you in New Caledonia. Yeah, yeah. That was that was the hardest trip I've ever taken. And and, and I almost didn't make it back alive, actually. <laughs> Another story. So so tell that story. We got time. <laughs> tell that story. We got plenty of time. Yeah, I, I had an incident with a uh, with the only snake that is native to New Caledonia. You know, the one that has cyanide for venom. I, I'm actually not familiar. Yeah, and it's uh, the sea the the sea crate. Okay. Oh. I had a little run in with one, but it's no big deal. But anyway, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna loop back um, to the terror skink. Um, so obviously, when you have an animal that is as rare as the terror skink, there's not going to be a lot of shared data on what island it's found on, um, mm -hmm. where it's, um, you know, how to find it. Um, so we basically were reading and studying everything that we could on where to find this. Before we went out there, uh, I'm going to have to go back and see it, but off the top of my head, I think that there was like five or six living specimens ever found. Uh, by Western Science, um, and I think ours was seven. I may be wrong on that. It's been two years, but um, anyway, we we kind of pinpointed it that we thought it was on this very specific island, and um, so we we put that island on our list of places to go to, um, and I think it was the second day that we were on the island we 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 actually did find it, and finding it and knowing that you are holding a lizard in your hands, that there have only been seven of these, six, five, six, seven of these ever found by Western science, ever. I don't think that I will ever be able to beat that. Wow. That's pretty impressive. It beats my tell, tell us what it looked like. <laughs> what did the scene look like? Capture, give us a penny. To the, oh, uh, it, 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 it was, it's every island in New Caledonia, and I didn't know this before I went over there, the trees are different. I mean, you can see every island from each other. You know, you can see the islands off in the horizon and whatever. But the vegetation, the trees, they're all different on all of these islands, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So on Moro, we were seeing tree and plant species that we weren't seeing on Bayonets. And I, the only thing that I can think of is that, you know, Bayonets is just the whole island is coral. It was a coral reef, and therefore it doesn't have the same soil that, like, Moro has. So if that's accurate, then, of course, yes, different plants are going to be able to grow on the rocky coral islands that aren't going to be able to grow on the more, you know, soiled, soiled islands. Good, Dave. Good. On the <laughs> islands that have, you know, a different kind of soil. Um, so that kind of makes sense, but it was one of those things that I didn't even realize that – that was something that we were going to encounter. Um, so where we were, where we found the terror skink on that island, um, there was a lot more uh, taller trees than on some of the other islands. Um, and I, I don't think that that has anything to do with anything. 
Um, but there was it, it was a it was a strange mix of these little atolls, and on the other side of the island, you had more you know soil for different plant species to grow in. Um, so I don't know if it's those diverse that that diversity in habitats on this single island, and that's why this particular skink happens to be there. Um, there's just there's no work done to figure out and to answer all these questions. Um, so we're just basically left with speculation. I mean, that entire trip, we left with more questions than were answered, for sure. On one of the islands, I think, Moro, we actually saw, you know, two lychee eggs on the ground and a male lychee who was, I don't know, like on this vine right next to the eggs that was completely unfazed by us being there, and it actually showed defensive behavior instead of fl you know fleeing from us like all the other leeches did. Wow. So was that male guarding that nest? We have no idea. We have no idea. But in the time that we were there, what we witnessed while we were there, you know, it certainly begged that question. Now somebody's going to have to go there and spend you know a lot of time and a lot of research to find out if that is in fact what was happening but you know all that we did you know there's a difference between hypothesis and theory mm -hmm. hypothesis is i think this is happening theory is i've proven this to be happening so the hypothesis is the question and we came back with more questions than 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 I think that I can even count. And there are a lot of PhD studies just waiting to happen on those islands. Mm. So, yeah. Time for New Caledonia Part 2. I don't think I'll ever go back to New Caledonia. Just because you almost died, or? No. Uh, <laughs> there, was, there was an issue that we had with the, um, with the French government. Uh, they weren't happy that we bypassed them to go to the natives and ask their permission to be on the islands. The uh, people are the ones that um, have control over the islands that we went to, but the French government thinks that they do. So when we got back to Noumea, they found out that we got permission from the Kanak tribe to go to the islands. As a matter of fact, the chief of the Kanak was the one who took us out to the islands himself. Um, when we got back to Noumea, uh, which is on the mainland, they treated us like criminals. Uh, wow. As soon as we got off the airplane, they they um, took us in a little room, went through all of our luggage. Um, they wouldn't l let us, you know, talk on our behalf. They were extremely militant about it. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. Only later did, you know, we kind of put the pieces together and we kind of talked to, um, and we talked to the chief after that and said, this, is, this happened to us. Um, and he was like, yeah, that's how the French government, you know, you, you, you didn't go through them and they were, and they were punishing you essentially. Um, so as long as the, I'm sorry, but as long as the French have control of those islands, I don't think I'll go back because of the way that we were treated. Secondly, the only reason why I would go back is for gargoyle geckos, which we did happen to look for. Uh, but I would say conservatively about 80% of their habitat has been destroyed by nickel mining. Wow. So for me to go back to those islands, and it was ridiculously expensive. You know, it was $150 just to pitch a tent at a campsite. Wow. So the only reason I'd go back is for gargoyle geckos, and with their habitat that destroyed, I'm not going to spend the money to go back there. I don't blame you. Um, so when you're picking your trips, I mean, is it selfish? Do you think it's something that would really make you happy and you go? Or do you have voices of reason telling you where they think you should go next? No, I, I will sit there and think, first of all, I'll think, what, is, what, what does my audience want to see? You know, what um, I, I learned, I, I almost learned the hard way that going to, you know, the places that I want to go to, like the Amazon and finding all those really weird frogs that, you know, um, that are found in the Amazon or weird salamanders um, that are found in the Amazon. I geek out about that stuff. Uh, the, the viewers, you know, they, they find it interesting, I'm sure. But if I go do a video in Madagascar on panther chameleons in the wild, or I go to the Amazon to say, hey, look at this cool salamander, what is my audience going to want to see, you know, more? 
And so I kind of, when I, when I think about, you know, the, the videos that I'm going to shoot, I think about what does my audience want to see first? And then I'll, I'll see how easy it is to get to that country, um, how expensive it is to get to that country, what else is found in that country. Um, and so there's a whole kind of process that I build off of. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always thinking of my audience before I think about what I want to do. So. No, I think um, when we talked last time, you had mentioned that um, your next trip was going to be for Burmese pythons. That's going to be postponed for a little while. No, we, so we tried that uh, twice in Thailand um, and we never found the bloods. We never found the berms. And then when I did more research, um, there's berms crawling all over Hong Kong Island. So what I wanted to do, uh, and there's a lot of other cool stuff there. There's trinket snakes, there's bamboo rat snakes. There's, I mean, everybody thinks of Hong Kong as this huge metropolis, which it is, but the rest of the island is pretty much national parks. Um, and, and, and from what I've seen and from what I've researched, it's a beautiful place. Obviously, I'm not going to get there anytime soon, but um, I, I will reserve that for later, and, and, and I'll go do my berms in the wild video on Hong Kong. Hmm. So how do you uh, deal with the current situation of being is that most oh, of you, your work is traveling? Like it sucks. <laughs> I um I I've I've had to cancel a lot of trips. We were gonna do ball pythons in the wild this spring. Uh, that would be cool. Yeah, that I mean that was that was on the rocks before coron uh, 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 coronavirus. So that it you know got postponed not a heartbreaker it's been postponed for two years now the mm -hmm. reason is, is because you know to get into togo benin ghana you know it's not like going to australia where you buy a 20 dollar visa at the airport and you get into the country you know you need inoculations you need you know proper paperwork and whatever and because benin and uh togo um they they don't have any really functioning embassies anywhere. So you have to drive to the border and get your visa at the border. Um, and that could take a day. I mean, we could be stuck at the border for a day waiting for the visa to come through. Man. Or if we That's pay crazy. the rate, all that visa will come through in five minutes. So it's, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different um, uh, way of doing things over there. And it's, it's very difficult to plan on when to go. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to go when the ball pythons are hatching. So when the people go out there and find the ball pythons, the, the gravid females bring them back, they lay their eggs, they go release the females, they incubate the eggs. When those eggs are hatching at these farms uh, around this time of year, that's when I want to go. So could we go in the fall? Of course, but I'd miss that whole kind of hatch that I really want to film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, all my, I was going to go out to New York. I was going to go to New Jersey. I was going to go to the White Plains Expo. I, I was going to do all of these things this summer and they, they've all been canceled. So, I mean, clearly you, you're having a little bit more time because you're on here with us. I mean, it must be real bored. <laughs> Rock bottom. <laughs> time time to burn. If I had anything to do right now, I'd be here with you guys. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so, I mean, when are you going to get down to uh, Missouri, though? It's really open to have you out here sometime in the, like early spring. Hey, well, you're two states south of me, you know. I mean, I'd, uh, I I don't know. You know, right now I'm I'm not in panic mode yet, but I think later on in the summer I'm going to be in panic mode. And one of the things that I don't want to have happen because of what's going on in the world is I don't want my videos to – lose any sort of quality. I don't want to have to say, oh my God, it's Wednesday. I don't have Saturday's video. Grab my cell phone and let's go find a garter snake. If I'm going to do a garter snake video, I'm going to do a garter snake in the wild video and do it right. So because I do that, I think three, four months in advance of the videos that are going to come out. And so without me being able to travel, we'll have to see what happens in a couple of months. So um, what you're saying is you're just not desperate enough yet to come out and see me? I, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying, Dave. I love you. I love you. Mustache, but I just uh, – <laughs> no, I, I really, really do. But, you know, this time of year is like the time to be herping Minnesota. Everything is just coming out. Um, it's the easiest time of year to find all the goodies out there. And in four weeks, everything's kind of kind of be dispersed and 
you know, heading to their summer, you know, haunts for the, uh, for the next couple of months. They're going to be really difficult to find in June and July. Um, so this time of year is when I really want to stay put here in Minnesota to find all the stuff that I want to find and film for future videos. But I will make it down to Missouri. We will go herping. I've been telling you that for five years. By the time <laughs> that, Maybe you know, this time. <laughs> yeah. 2025, we are going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever even pursued a woman as hard as I've pursued you to come down and visit me. And I, I feel like your left down right now is probably the most gentle left down I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, but it's, it's, I don't know. I have no excuses. I have no excuses. <laughs> No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll send you a bunch of pictures of baby skinks in about a month when they start hitting the ground, and I'm going to go out and find some kind of crazy morph in the wild and, you know, make you look at it, and I'll just have a droop it off, like I make an ass or something, so you have to suffer a little bit. You know, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, yeah, yeah, do it. Do it. Because I will be trapped right in this room editing videos right there, and I will see your little ding come up on Facebook, and when you send me those photos, I really do look at them, and I'm like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, I'm just trying to entice you, man. That's it. I'm just trying I'll to entice. I, w I will be there, but um, just not now. We're we're just not there yet. I get it. Not now, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> we just had uh, Megan Kelly on, and she it took Dave like four years to become friends with her. So at so least, like, yeah. Who are they? <laughs> It was terrible. Oh, yeah. terrible. <laughs> she just rubbed it in my face. So I just, I don't even know. I, I don't even remember how she was making fun of me, but I know it hurt. I know it hurt really bad. <laughs> Here, here's, here's, here's my take on people that make fun of you. And, and this isn't, this isn't mine. I, I, I think Mel Brooks actually said this. Don't quote me on that, but somebody like him said this. I will coach you on that. That yeah. as soon as, as soon as the people around you quit making fun of you, you're dead. Because if, if people stop making fun of you, that means they couldn't give a shit about you anymore. Mm. That's so fine. You are the center of attention. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best at life at the moment is what you're saying. This is – it's all right. right, right, right. right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're up there, man. I, 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 I am up there. Oh, no shit. Fun of me, but not like a hurtful kind of calling me Davis sort of way. But <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's pretty hurtful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's better than Gene Short Jesus. Yeah, I've heard that oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> I know where. So uh, I love Ryan like a brother. Absolutely love the man. And I think that I wore Gene Shorts one. <laughs> one. Time. There we go. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. There <laughs> right. we go. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now he's gonna go herping with it. That, that is completely stuck with Ryan. Yeah, I don't see the problem here. I don't like you guys are making fun of jean shorts. <laughs> I'm saying it. Nobody's making fun of anything. <laughs> right? We are, we accept all kinds here. Let me tell you something, guys. I rock those jean shorts. <laughs> I I mean, really high cut with the pockets hanging down past the cut. <laughs> hey, when I you got it, you got it, buddy. Actually, but then he had to go off with Erica, and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so bring it up uh ryan a bit the, when you you were supposed to fly in for tinley yeah you got back from australia dave ryan and i were there at tinley this year and we went up and we hung out with uh, ryan mcveigh and erica mm -hmm. and uh ryan was like oh yeah you know brian and and dave are gonna be coming by and you guys can hang out and stuff and we're like all right yeah sure and then that next morning we're like did they even make it into the country? Like, I don't even know what happened. We and, uh, landed at O'Hare, and as we landed and were taxiing to the gate, our phones blew up that Tinley was canceled. <laughs> so we flew from Brisbane to Chicago, only to find out that it was canceled. And, hey. and we landed in L.A. L.A. was our point of entry into the country. And Brian even said, I am, I, am I an asshole for wanting to go home right now? Because he lives two hours away from LAX. And I was like, no, I mean, if you're not going to film Tinley, go home. He goes, no, I'll regret that for the, you know. So, yeah, we continued on to Chicago. And then he literally, the next morning, flew right back to L.A. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Well, uh, I mean, honestly, Tinley wasn't Tinley, but I still had a blast. Um, well, thing, I heard yeah. everybody got together in the parking lot, and, and it was a lot of fun. And I wish that I would have known that 
because I would have stayed and filmed that and, you know, filmed Tinley in the parking lot this year. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people try to make awards, you know, for, you know, somebody's booth in their trunk. It would have been awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they, we had a lot of uh, in the room, the hotel room uh, booths set up and stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah, I bet. See, and I missed all of that, but, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, let me ask you guys a question. Do you think that all expos are going to be canceled for the rest of 2020? It's a coin flip. I don't think so. Uh, I'm optimistic. I, I don't want it to happen, but I, I don't want it to happen either. But I think it's gonna. I think it's a we, definite I possibility. Yeah, I don't think there's gonna be any big events in general in 2020. I think it's gonna be okay. 1,000 people or less, or 500 people or less for the rest of the year. Nothing's gonna happen. No concerts, right. no sporting events. This is gonna be the year of nothing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're not even producing uh, movies right now. They put all that on hold. Right. Every, Right. Yeah, uh, I think White Plains canceled for the rest of the year. They announced that, I believe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I, there's there's a couple of staple expos that I go to. You know, Tinley obviously is the number one. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in not any sort of order, but you know, Pomona and the uh, the Canadian Reptile Expo in in Toronto, Daytona when I can get down there, and I think they're all one by one going to be canceled. <laughs> Yeah, which just kind of breaks my heart, but I think it's going to happen. That sucks. It sucks yeah. to think about it, but not a lot of options. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> what you're take with yeah. I got a. I can't remember who sent it to me, but there was a virtual show going on. I think today for a reptile expo, or I don't yeah. think I really fully understood the gist. Did anybody pay attention to that? I did, and I and I've been. I'm going to do one on the 16th. Okay. So, uh, hang on a second before I say something that I shouldn't be saying. Just a moment. I, I've left you guys. I am going to make sure that. Hang on. Don't go away. You guys. Where are you? Hang on. He has hang a window on. up, but he doesn't realize his camera is still on. Yeah, Dave is so fucking important. He has to read to see what he can say or not say to us. <laughs> well, well, I just want to make sure that I. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the big never mind. Let's go to the next topic. Yeah. So <laughs> while I'm, while I'm looking at this because, of course, I can't just find it immediately. It's all good. Okay. There's that. There's that. There's that. There's that. There's that. Yeah. We're not going to edit any of this out. You, have, you better have a big finish here. This better be, <laughs> this better be real fucking special. I'm going to be as big a disappointment to you as I am to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Rough. <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, as far as the online expos are concerned, um, it's it's a very interesting uh, thing. Hang on, what thing did I have my camera on? Look at how organized I am. This is awesome. Join stream right there. I got it. Okay, I'm back. I can see you guys. Um, it, it's it's a really interesting concept, and I've been talking with Tom Kelly, who does uh, Reptile Stream, and you know I. I knew nothing about it, so I started talking to him about it. And uh, he's based out of uh, 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 the Pittsburgh area. And apparently, from what I understand, and I'm going to be doing his his expo, reptilescream.com. I'm going to be doing his on the 16th. Um, it's it's a it's basically virtual. So exactly what we're doing now, I'm going to set up the camera over there in my in my reptile room with all my you know racks behind me and whatever. And I'm going to do a question and answer thing with, you know, all the fans. But, you know, if you um, sell reptiles and you can't get to these expos, you can you can buy a table um, and then people go to reptilestream.com and they see all the vendors. They click on that and, you know, you're one on one with the vendor in their own house. And then that vendor can say, OK, I've got this ball python for sale. I've got this boa for sale, I've got this thing, this is how to pay me, this is you know, how I'll ship it to you. Um, it sounds like a really cool idea, a really cool idea. And, and as I was talking to Tom about it, I was um, you know, saying that there are a lot of people that I talk to who go to the expos and some of the vendors you know, will actually have photos of their setup to show how they're caring for these animals, what their you know uh, uh, facility looks like, so that people can have a you know more confidence in buying 
you know, their, their reptile from that person. And this is a perfect opportunity for all of those people out there that are, you know, in the market for a reptile to see the, the facilities of the people that they're buying from. So I think that is a really good thing uh, to, to have, but I, 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 and I wonder if once we get back to the, you know, the, the meet and greet type of uh, expos that we all know and love, will this still be a thing? And I think, yeah, it will, actually, because there's a lot of people that can't get to, you know, this expo or that expo. So I'm probably asking the wrong person the questions here, but, you know, because, you know, I'm a show whore and I love going out. I love dealing with people. Um, so the dynamics of this. Um, so here I am set up in the Bolinelli parking lot. I bring a bunch of snakes out and I wait for somebody to click on the screen and want to talk to me. Just like somebody coming up to a show. And is there a line of people waiting to talk? And I'm going to miss people because I'm going to spend too much time one on one with one person. That is a, that is a, a like, very good questions that I don't know the answer to yet. And I don't, um, it's so new. I don't think, you know, anybody knows the answers to those yet. But Think about it like classified ads. You know, you go through the list of classified ads. You see the picture of the snake or the lizard or whatever. Think about it as if you click on to see the picture of the snake, you are actually in a video uh, kind of conference with the breeder and can see that, that, that you know, thing. So I, 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 don't, I missed it today, unfortunately. I was out in the field. So I, I'm just kind of talking from non-experience. But I would assume that, you know, if you're looking for a ball python, you know, you click on ball python or whatever. I don't know that it works that way. But, you know, it, it's kind of like if you're going to an expo and you have an idea of what you're going to be looking for at that expo anyway, you just go to this website with the intention of, I'm going to be looking for a new king snake. And then, you know, go and, and find all the people that have king snakes. Hmm. Sounds like a cool concept, and I'm sure it's going to evolve after a little bit. It, like it is after it is. a few of them, I, I think I think it's a pretty cool idea. It kind um, of the, does cool the idea that thing. Thing. classified ads actually. So when the world gets back to you know where it it, it, it once was, and I, I hesitate to use the word normal because we're we're not going to go back to normal. Um, but when people can still you know go to Tinley by the thousands, um, I think this is still going to be around, and I think that this. Mm -hmm will evolve into the replacement for classified ads. Hmm. Um, I mean, are you sure? It sounds like <laughs> no. it's time consuming. No. Like it's extremely time consuming. I, I have, I have, nobody knows at this point. So what? all we can do is guess as to what this thing is going to evolve into. As far as I know, there have only been two so far in the world that have happened. And I think both of those happened today. So this thing is so new, who knows what's, what, what it's going to morph into. When we could all get back together, these things could just dry up and go away. Dave really is, wants to know, like, does he really have to get good Wi-Fi at his house or, or not? Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm never going to be able to go to an expo because my Wi-Fi is so bad. I will never close the sale with my Wi-Fi. There's, the, see, there's, there's one of the variables that is the unknown. How many people that live in rural areas that don't have – bandwidth enough to go to these things are actually going to, you know, right. <laughs> right. Right. Too I'm many variables, really not enough answers. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm really just here for the background. Maybe I could make that this work. Awesome. I, don't try to get, so I don't know. That, that is awesome. Is that like, is that an actual bowling alley or did you just find that in a, like, no, a no, bowling alley. Hey, I'm going to put up this really cool seventies thing. Yeah, no, we've talked about this bowling alley. It's for sale right now. It's been closed for over a year. It's just it, sitting here, and I'm using it right now, so it's nice. You're using it as your facility? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I'm facilitating this video from it, if that's what you're asking me. But if you had, like, a bowling alley, can you imagine, like, the, the facility that you would have in that bowling alley? Oh, oh we've talked about this with Bob Vu on the first podcast. Um, liquor license involved in it. You know, the whole new experience <laughs> of going to buy a reptile and bowling at the same time. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, awesome. awesome. that's the way to get me to come to Missouri, right there. Hey, if you say bowling, I'll take you bowling, buddy. I, I love bowling. I, I'm a man who enjoys bowling. You're from Minnesota. Uh, bowling, I, I'm a man who enjoys bowling and beer and pizza. All right. It is on. <laughs> Pizza glass, should beer, but we'll try anyways. <laughs> Bowling, beer, pizza, and herping. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> but no, I mean, like I said, I'm I'm all about new concepts, and um, you know, again, back to you know, saying adapt or die again. Um, you know, 
I think what Facebook was out or was banning all sales of reptiles. Then yeah, like a whole new animals, yeah. Facebook started up and everyone right. started flocking over there. And then I haven't oh, heard anything about yeah. it in months. Is, yeah. that, is that what you're talking about? That MeWe site? Yeah. yeah. yeah that we all signed up for and never have returned, have we? I haven't. Nope. No, I haven't. Yeah. Same. I think yeah. I posted one picture. Yeah, I think I did too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I will say this, and, you know, um, you know, we talked about Bob about, you know, the lack of shows right now and, you know, the scare of what this could do to the hobby. But I've talked to a lot of readers that I've been pleasantly surprised at how sales are going with people. Like, people are telling me this is yeah. the best they've ever done in sales in their entire life. The best they've ever done. So I, I we all know Mark Bailey. Yep. yep. So I, uh, I met him in a field uh, a couple hours north of here. We always meet at this field and go just – Drug deal? Yeah, well, <laughs> quiet. Oh, not funny. You had to do that. You uh, do that, man. No, we uh, <laughs> went herping. We always kind of meet and, and we wind up wandering around this prairie just talking about everything. And if we happen to see a snake, hey, great, we see a snake. That's how Mark Bailey and I herp. Yeah. But we were talking about that very thing. He, um, he couldn't meet me there yesterday because he had so many orders that he was having trouble keeping up with them. Wow. Yep. And that has never happened before. I mean, usually I'm like, hey, I'm going to the field. He'll be like, I'm on my way. Yeah. Wow. See, everybody had, just has pockets full of money that they're waiting to spend at shows. And they shows. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, I talked to Oz, too, about this the other day because we picked up a couple animals from him. And, you know, he made a good point, too. Um, what are we spending our money on right now? We're not going out to dinner. We're not going right. to do shows. We're not traveling. I mean, right. the money just had enough. And in this hobby, that burns a hole in your pocket. Why not go buy a snack? Absolutely. Yeah. I just bought a bunch of gargoyle geckos. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we all know what you're out there just buying right now. And yeah. I don't know if it's from the lack of expos. I mean, sure that has a lot to do with it. And, you know, like I said, that's why I'm kind of intrigued by this virtual expo. And I'm going to do some more reading on it this week. Um, how much would it cost for me just to show up and drink? <laughs> like, do I have to buy a table to have a beer and just talk to people? At uh, the virtual thing? Yeah. Well, you have to bring your own beer. Well, I mean, I can handle that. Yeah, yeah. No, if you, then it costs you the cost of the beer. But uh, to oh, get, I don't, the, have, to, I don't have to buy a table that people come and talk to me. Yeah, I think it's five bucks. Well, it's five bucks for people to get into the website. I'm not sure how much it is for a table. Interesting. Yeah. So can we? Um, I mean, can we do a podcast at the virtual reality show next week and just literally go table to table and talk to vendors? Huh. That's a hey, very. Dave. That's our fucking idea, by the way. Pat's and Penny. <laughs> yeah, I had that idea, you know, before I, I started this. Uh... Yeah, did it say that you got it in writing? Because yeah. I got it ready now. Yeah, see, right there. That's the uh, <laughs> down right there. Hey, guys, so we got to plan something for the 15th, not the 16th. Put it out there. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There we go. Um, no, actually, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know how well that would work. And, and, and the reason I don't know is because I have never been in one before. So I will have more info on that after the 16th, and I'll let you know. Yeah, you, you know. were pretty hard and heavy about it, and now you're really downplaying it, man. Well, I, I will let you know how your idea won't work after you know, I do it. You pay $5, you go bug people, they get no sales, but they have to do an interview with you. Like, no, but seriously, I did, I did think about that when I was asked to do this. I was like, can I turn this into an episode? I mean, how do I kind of go around? and So I, honestly, I'm 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 – Shooting in the dark. I have no idea what this is going to do. I have no idea what this is going to turn into. It's a it's a brand new world. Dave, Dave, I could do it. I know how to do it. Yeah, yeah, I know. You exactly don't even know how, how to name the videos properly, man. You're naming two different things, and we're not getting hit through. That's true. You are mismanaging this channel. No, believe me, I I have not mastered how to name my videos. I but I do know how that we could interview people like that. All right. So, but anyway, but we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about it on, offline. Oh, <laughs> what's the um? So, what should we name this video for the most hits? Um, is Kim Jong Un dead? Coronavirus? Like, yeah. what needs to be the title on this video so more than two hundred people watch it? Uh, I was cured. I, I, I cured my coronavirus by drinking bleach. Ah, okay. There you go. Nothing gets hits. With <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I like that. Yeah. I yeah, yeah. Cor Dave Kaufman drinks bleach to cure his coronavirus. There you go. That's it. 
I'd so, watch the video on it. <laughs> do you want to go ahead and pause the video, go rinse out a bleach um, jug, come back over <laughs> here and start sipping from the jug for the rest of the episode? We need uh, a thumbnail, man. We need a thumbnail. I mean, I can uh, edit a lot of clear, man, my but, you know. <laughs> Feel it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we better get these guys asking some questions. I, I'm not really sure where I'm taking this right now. <laughs> Things are getting a little weird. I don't know. Uh, that's great. Well, that's, uh, that's why you guys invite me out here. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I've done my part. I'm wow, just gonna out. That's right. <laughs> um, all right, well, I have a, a question. What's what's your uh, favorite story of finding the most dangerous animal you've ever found? Like lifting up that rock and seeing something, well, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Chupacabra. Um. <laughs> God, okay, so hang on a second. Did so, you ever find a chupacabra? I am the chupacabra. <laughs> no, uh, no, we never found those in Mexico. And we looked. There's saw tracks, saw scat, but no chupacabra. You didn't drink enough tequila. I think that, that is the exact problem that we you have. To, you have yeah. to follow the trail of, of uh, goats that are dead with their... That's right. That's right. Something's out there killing them. That's right. We don't know what it is. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> the most dangerous animal you found? The story the of it. Okay. Aside from, aside from the, the water. So area. I am in Kansas. And I'm with a, a, gr a great group of guys. Um, and we see these stacked pallets. And they're, they're crushed and whatever. They're sitting on top of each other. They're not like just stacked pallets where nothing can get out you know, underneath them. And so we flip the top one, ringneck snakes. We flip the next one, and, you know, we're all in a circle around this stack, and somebody's holding this one, somebody's holding this one, somebody's holding that one. You know, milk snake, black rat snake. It's just the most awesome pile of stuff that you've ever seen. And we get to the bottom one, and we can see that it's sitting in the grass, and we're like, this is it. Every snake that's in this pile is going to be under this one. Here we go. We all have our hands full of these, like, broken down pallets. Nobody can move anywhere. And I don't remember if it was me or somebody else got the honor of flipping the last one to see all those cool snakes, all the king snakes and all the rat snakes and everything that was going to be under this thing. And so he flips it, and we scare the shit out of a skunk. <laughs> all of this. Who stayed put while we were, like, Tearing apart his house, wow. all all of us. There were like six of us. We all like literally skyrocketed away. We <laughs> the poor damn skunk. All the shit fell back on top of him. <laughs> and then I I sat there and I was like, you know, none of us were sprayed. We scared the shit out of him. He, he didn't have time to react to spray us. But then I was really worried about the skunk, and I wanted to go back and flip the stuff off of the skunk to make sure the skunk was okay. But didn't really want to, you know, snake stink for the rest of the trip. That was the most dangerous thing. I, I know that wasn't what you were asking, but that was the most dangerous thing. But the most dangerous thing you're always going to find by flipping stuff are the hornets that are under there that you disturb. That's what I thought you were going to say. Like a beehive or to me, and and I don't know what species it was, but in Wisconsin I flipped one and stirred up the hornet's nest, and they nailed me like one after another. I'm running, and they're on me, and they're stinging me. By the time I got to the car, I woke up on the ground. Wow. And I don't know. And I've never, I'm not allergic to them, but I, I probably was stung at least, at least 10 or 12 times. And wow. I, I yeah. Yeah. Oh, Did yeah. anybody read the story that popped up on Facebook a couple hours ago about killer hornets or killer wasps? Oh, Coming I did. I did see that. Yeah. Did anybody read the details on that? I didn't get around to it yet. I saw it on the drive over. I, I did what everybody else did and just read the headline and made an assumption from the headline. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. That's what I figured. So Texas is fucked is what we're saying. I mean, I'm not right, sure. Right. Yeah. Coming from. I don't think Texas exists any longer after that. Killer yeah. hornets are in America and they're shooting you up with coronavirus. That's right. That's, yeah. right. That's what I got. We're in a partnership with the Africanized bees. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We got to start giving them bleach. That's right. <laughs> I hear, I hear it. Here's a spray bottles full of bleach. It's all there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Just no, for the no, record, no, 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 the article, I'm really yeah. enjoying 2020 so far. I don't know about you guys, but um, it. it's been a pretty good year. This is the best year ever. It's the best year ever. Best I don't year think it's ever going to get better than this. And it's a lot of stories. So well, didn't it? Mm. I mean, it really did. Yeah, uh, this is this is awesome. I'm loving it. I not you know, there's been a couple tragedies. You know, the Kobe thing was kind of sad. If you like basketball, which yeah. you know, I like Kobe. 
But um, yeah, no, it's been one after another. I'm really getting a kick out of 2020, man. It's I, I, I cannot wait to see what comes next. Yeah, Hornets, man. Apparently it's Hornets. But uh, until there's a death, we're not talking about it. Right, right. Hornets that have AIDS. Ooh, AIDS Hornets. Space yeah. AIDS Hornets. Yeah, yeah. Man. Avian AIDS. Avian AIDS. Hornets give you AIDS. That's You heard it here first. That's in the thumbnail. Not yeah. a conspiracy theory. <laughs> you know, it's funny. This this works for like everybody. <laughs> hey, you, you put you added an e to that. What's there an e at the end of the day? <laughs> well, that's certainly he's talking about you, not me. <laughs> we that's, that's a standing rude. banner we have on there. That's so funny. That's <laughs> <a standard banner. laughs> yeah, that one and then three up is probably appropriate as well. Uh, yeah, that's the other <laughs> banner. That, <laughs> that's uh, AIDS wasps. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so out of all your adventures, uh, what is the the most impressive collection you've seen? Oh, uh, Jean Paul in Amsterdam. Kind of yeah, funny, uh, that, uh, the <laughs> guy with the castle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was that that was something that you know. Very rarely do I ever just put down the camera and just look around and go, "Holy shit!" And that happened quite a bit while I was at his place. The uh, amount of effort and labor of love you could tell he put into that place. He did. He did. And it's very sad what happened to him. Something happened to him? Lost it all. What? I didn't hear this. Lost it all. How? I'm not going to get into the drama. I'm not going to point fingers. But he had a falling out with his ex. And Uh. Jean-Paul is... Wow. Wow. Yeah. Man, I keep bringing up downers. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was, I was just, <laughs> you I, like, like, everything I asked is like, this. I, uh, I was just going to say, hey, can you describe the collection? And now I'm like, no, don't, don't do that. Yeah. 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 Now it's like, yeah. uh, yeah, the way we'll the is going, let's talk about dead puppies or something to like. Yeah, that's what's our spirit. Last time you there. ran over a puppy. Uh, <laughs> I think it, I, so I do have a dead puppy story, or a you know it's not like a dead dead <laughs> puppy. Story, dead puppy. But, um, hey man, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well I did recently get offered a um, English bulldog, which I was really torn on, um, and I think the timing was just wrong. But you know he had an arrhythmia, um, not that great. He could live a month, he could live a year, he could live two years, but um, he's adorable. Really, um, you know, getting such a little heart cord. That's even the right way of putting it, but. Um, I don't know. just couldn't make it work right now. Just too many other animals on the farm. But um, I really kind of wanted that puppy that was inevitably going to die sooner than later. So yeah, you're welcome. Wait a minute. Where's the puppy now? Um, well, the puppy's still with a vet at the moment or um, you know, a friend of mine that works at the vet office. There's a few people that I think are going to take it in. Um, like I said, we, we have so many animals right now. Um, you know, with the barn and everything, it, it makes it really tough to appreciate every last thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Not always the answer. Yeah. Um, so I'm very content with the zoo that we have on the property right now. And don't get me wrong, that English bulldog is my dream dog, but um, just can't make it work right now. Suckful. Yeah, sad. Suckful. So, Dave, um, let's talk. Water. So, you know, as a person who likes to go out and flip it all that, you know, and it's probably because I also breed the chance of finding a mutation in the wild is kind of like, no matter what the species is, the one moment, like that trophy catch, if you're fishing, do you care? Or like, are you like hoping that someday you might be able to see a true mutation in the wild? Or is that really? Hang on a second. Let me count. Oh, and how many morphs you found? Hang on. I'm thinking (laughs) one. I found one morph in the wild. Uh, leucistic cottonmouths in Texas. Wow, that's cool. You made a video about it. Yeah, leucistic cottonmouths. And you snatched one of them up, right? <laughs> it was on private property. In order for me to get there to film, I was sworn to secrecy over the location. The um, owner is a herper. They know what they have on their property. They don't want anyone knowing where it is. Mm-hmm. That's so good. if that's you fair. want to video... I made very sure that nobody could tell where I was. Hmm. Well, I mean, there is already leucistic cottonmouths in the breeding sector of the house. There is, isn't there? there is, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've never seen one. Dang. But I've never seen like an albino yet. 
and it's a matter of time. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I was always really surprised that there weren't more mutations of um, copperheads found, and it seems like in the last couple of years there's been what the leucistic and albino last year. I know you got like the stripe and the patternless projects, but um, you know, the amount of them out there, I just figured there'd be more. Well, here's my theory on that. And I don't know if I'm right. Uh, I don't know if I'm wrong, but with shrinking habitats, you have more of a population shrinking. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, you have, you have a shrinking uh, you have shrinking habitat, therefore a shrinking population. Therefore, you're going to have more inbreeding inevitably within that shrinking population. Therefore, you're going to have more mutations found in the wild. So, okay, so that mutations in the wild and, you know, the trip that unfortunately didn't get to take to Africa. What is it? Why are there so many ball python mutations? Does it just come down to how many are being collected or is there just so many out there? I think that with ball pythons, there are so many of the morphs that have always been around that people just didn't pay attention to. You know, back in the early 90s, there were Mojaves out there. There were yellow bellies out there. There were lessers out there. It, but we didn't pay attention to them like we do now. And we didn't try breeding them together to say, hey, wow, you breed this to this, it makes an all-white snake. You know, they were just called, hey, this is a light-colored ball python. This is a weird-colored ball python. And then they would, you know, sell them with the ticks and the, and the, and the mites for 10 bucks, just like they did in the early 90s. And so these have always been around. I think that as soon as Kevin and Brian and Pete and, you know, all those guys started breeding ball pythons, um, or even before that, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, when Pete proved out the pied, um, when Bob proved out the albino, um, I think that that's when people started to say, okay, well, now what happens if I do breed this really pretty one to this other really pretty one? Mm. And, whoa, look at that. A whole, how did this snake come out of that clutch? And, and I think that, you know, it just happened that way. And then when that craze started, all the, you know, the, the, the collectors in Africa – you know, that, that the, the, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. The ball python market actually, in a way, is saving ball pythons in the wild. And the reason why is because those collectors used to take any snake they could find out in the wild, gravid or not. And they were depleting huge populations to ship thousands of these wild-caught ball pythons all over the world. Well, the morphs come out, and what the they started doing in Africa was they were like, well, wait a minute, I can get really big money for this really pretty ball Python, really big money. So what they started to do was instead of taking those females, those gravid females and just shipping them over, they would take those gravid females, wait for them to lay their eggs, release the female back into the wild and then incubate those eggs and any funky monkeys that came out of those eggs, they would call a morph and they would sell for big money. And so I, I now, unfortunately, that the ball python market is going a little bit, you know, it has calmed a little bit than it used to be even 15 years ago. Unfortunately, what a lot of these collectors out in Africa are doing is they're taking those females, having them lay their eggs, and then selling the females to the leather trade. Mm. That's another story altogether. But um, because, you know, they're not making as much money as they once did. But, yeah, I mean, as far as why there are so many morphs, I think it has to do with that, that they were just, you know, every little, like, the pastels that came out. Um, when they first came out and they were, like, this really beautiful yellow snake, well, we already had those. They were called jungles. Well, the jungle didn't reproduce itself, and therefore, you know, Greg Graziani stopped trying to produce that. Well, then this other one comes along. He starts producing that, and wow, look at that. It makes the super form. So I think that, yeah, these snakes have always been there, but it isn't until we started breeding pretty one to pretty one that all these morphs started coming out and thus starting the ball python craze. So it's like the potential is there. It's just we have to uh, – there has to be some sort of incentive, either population shrinkage or us – you know, shrinking the genetic pool and putting things back together so that yeah, they yeah. express themselves. Yeah, but that is yeah. interesting because, and then you look at retics. You know, look at all the morphs of retics that are out now. Mm -hmm. You know, 
but in a, in a very short amount of time. It didn't take us more than 15, 20 years, sometimes even 10 years, to come up with all these other morphs. I mean, it happened super fast. Oh, yeah. So you believe then if we went to South America and started looking for bows 24 hours a day, we have the potential of finding multiple mutations out there while bringing gravid females back? Or don't you know. don't think there's anything necessarily special about the boat or about ball pythons and why there's so many mutations, just population so big and with so many people looking for them, that's the main reason? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a black or white answer. I think there's a lot of gray variables as to why this has happened the way that it has happened. But, you know, for, for those of us that were back in the hobby in the early to mid-90s, you know, we were talking about boa constrictors, you know, th there weren't any morphs. Um, there were localities that people wanted. You know, everybody wanted the Suriname boas because they had the real thin saddles and they were real clean and they were just gorgeous snakes. Um, and, and I think that as more more started happening as those two albino strains came into the into the picture you know i think that the the the, the morphs i'll just say that were actually localities kind of faded away i mean i don't know that i've seen a pure they're out there of course but i don't think that i've seen a pure suriname you know boa in a long long time um I mean, honestly, and, you know, it's somebody we're actually going to have on here, but um, I, when anybody ever asks about a locality, I always say go see Vin Russo. Um, I feel like he's got some of the purest stuff out there, and I know there's other people that are doing a lot, but, you know, the diversity of that guy's collection, all the random little boa. I have got to get out there and film him, yeah. Yeah, no, For I sure. love Vin. Vin's honestly one of my favorite breeders in the industry just because he's, in my opinion, very accomplished and everything he's really played with. He's a great guy. Very yeah, well for, sure. So, for sure. And he likes the fish, and you can't beat that. So I, sure. I like that a lot. For sure. But um, So here's a question, and just because I don't have an answer. Um, so was there a picture of a pied ball python back in, like, the 60s or 70s in Guyana? Correct. Uh, have you actually ever got to see that picture? I've yes. heard about it, but I've never actually so, seen it. Highballed in ball pythons is nothing new. And it is a naturally occurring morph. There are still, to this day, wild populations of pied ball pythons out there. Hmm. Um, and um, I, one of the guys that I'm going to go over there with knows where this population is. And that's wow. what I, I, all I work with are pies. Um, and pied combos, of course. Um, and, and so for me to go out there and find a wild pied, that's going to replace the terror skink. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm really, but yes. So back in the sixties, um, a lot of the chiefs of that area used to wear pied ball pythons as jewelry. And it was, it was an actual status symbol within that tribal community that if you were wearing a pied ball python, that was a status symbol. And there were pictures that came out in, I'll, I'll I, don't know for sure, but I'm sure it was National Geographic back in the 60s of these, you know, the, these these uh, tribal chiefs wearing these piebald ball pythons around their neck. And that was back in the 60s. So, you know, herpticulture has, you know, back in the 60s, it was it was an infant. I mean, herpticulture really started in 1961 with Dr. Bredgel, bringing that very first uh, albino corn snake in Florida. That's what started everything that we do now. It all started from that catalyst. Um, and so for back in the 60s, they just saw this snake with a lot of white on it and said, wow, that's cool. And even when pides were being imported in the late 80s and early 90s, the importers were saying, I can't sell that snake. It's a junk snake. Nobody's going to buy this snake. They're going to think it's broken. <laughs> mm. and unfortunately, a lot of pides back in that period wound up in the freezer because the importers couldn't sell them. Or we're afraid to even try to sell them. That's amazing. Wow. Yep. So, and again, it wasn't until Pete said, "I'm going to prove this thing out," that people started to take notice of the pies. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, so, one other story from the past: um, Hog Island boas. Yeah. Now, that they're pretty much completely depleted in the wild at this point. I've yeah, heard they, they, they it, them, you just can't find them. It's interesting that island is so tiny, and in in one of the things that I I just kind of cringe at is we've gotten to a point now to where we have 
I'll just say educated the public to the point of let's save the environment, let's save these habitats, let's save our ecosystems, let's really take a look at the damage that humanity has been doing for the past hundred years and try to reverse that. We've come a long way in doing that. The backlash of that is that it grew ecotourism to the point where it's kind of a double-edged sword now. So instead of going out and killing sharks for shark fin soup, places like Palau um, have discovered that, yes, you can go and kill a shark, rip off its fins and get $100. Or you can let that shark live and get $2 million in ecotourism revenue. And therefore, you know, sharks are being saved because of this. Well, when it comes to reptiles, places like Hog Island um, are attracting a huge amount of ecotourism. And when you get tourists, no matter how good their intentions are, you get destroyed habitat. You get garbage everywhere. You get, you know, people that found out that... The, the, this particular species is sought after and people will pay money for it. I've got a boat. Let's go there and get as many as we can. These types of things are happening and they are depleting these, the, the, uh, the, the wild populations at, at an alarming rate. One of the places that I, another place that I almost lost my life when I was out in the, in the, in the field, I was on a sea turtle research uh, beach in uh, Costa Rica. And they finally got the public to recognize that this beach should be protected. Well, what happened then is that in this, there was a very famous case of this in 2015, where that beach had so many thousands of tourists that showed up while the turtles were trying to lay their eggs that the turtles said, screw this, and they left. And they never deposited their eggs. A lot of those turtles then died because they were egg bound. And so you have a lot of very well-meaning people that go to these places and they wind up destroying that, which we hoped that they would go to, to gain an appreciation and try to protect. And um, so I, I think that with, when we talk about Hog Island, when we talk about, you know, some of the other really fragile ecosystems that mainly take place on islands, New Caledonia, you know, included, we're, we're seeing a, lot, a rise of ecotourism, and because of that rise, um, we're seeing a lot of, 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 of species becoming rare in those areas. And it's, so, it's, yeah, it's a real double-edged sword. So Madagascar has always been like, you know, we've always imported a lot of stuff from Madagascar. And, you know, they open it up, they close it, they right. open different species. Um, I mean, do you think at Ebbly we're just going to clean that place out with this hobby? No, I think that what's going to happen to Madagascar is the deforestation is going to kill everything. And the yeah. deforestation that's happening in Madagascar is really alarming because people are chopping down all the trees for one purpose, and that's to make charcoal to cook on. And so it's, it's the way that they've been doing it for, for forever. And so when you go and introduce propane stoves when you go and say hey there's a new way to do this there's a more you know environmentally friendly way to do this they're not really catching on to the new way of doing things simply because they've been doing it a certain way for as long as they can remember and so yeah the deforestation to make charcoal on madagascar is what is going to sadly kill off a lot of these species that's wild yeah um so, and I want to get there before that happens. You should. Um, I don't know why I can't remember the name of this species right now, but um, there was that dwarf monitor, that really small aquatic monitor that was found years ago. Everyone in Madagascar? Was about it. Yeah, that was from deforestation. They found out that they were living in the root systems, and when trees were getting knocked over, all of a sudden, yeah. sudden it was everywhere. Yeah, what was that? Talking it about the earless like monitor? dragon, man. Who, anybody know the name? The Borneo earless monitor. No, yeah, the earless monitors. It, it, are you talking? Wait a minute. Are you? There's two different things we might be talking about. Are you talking about on Madagascar or Borneo? No, I'm talking about the Borneo, the earless. Oh, you are talking. Okay, 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 okay. Because yeah. I was going to say, I don't think there are monitors that have been. So th I thought you were talking about something that, like a paper that came out from something that had previously been discovered out there, which I would have been very interested to hear, read that paper if it was discovered on Madagascar. But all right, so we're talking about Borneo. Um, 
Uh, yeah, they're talking about the, the Borneo wireless monitors. Yeah, and they pretty much didn't exist. And then all of a sudden, we found a couple, and now they're everywhere if you know where to look for them. I'm not sure about that. I know that um, the deforestation on Borneo is worse than that on – maybe not worse, but it's, it's certainly at the same rate as uh, Madagascar. Um, but that's, you know, to make room for date palm plantations, uh, oil exploration. Um, and pretty soon the, 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 the forests on Borneo are going to be, you know, just a couple of very small, you know, reserves where orangutans and things like that uh, are, are going to not be able to live because, you know, they, the, their home range is going to be this going from this big to this big. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, the Borneo earless monitor, you know who to talk to about that? Ryan. Yeah, okay. we, we were able to hold some of them at the lab. Yep. So was I. It it was was when you held my monitors. I'm just letting Ryan keep those. All right, right. Well, we've got uh, dual ownership, I think. I've, we've signed paperwork. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah, I had no we had Community monitors. With everybody that wants to own those, I think they're just now community monitors. But they were, they're amazing. Yeah. They're yeah, but... I, 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 I will admit that I don't know yet uh, enough about their their natural history to answer that question without bullshitting you. Um, so, yeah, Ryan's the guy to ask about that. My understanding of it is they were thought to be extinct in the wild, and they found some, smuggled them out, and figured out that they're real easy to reproduce in, in captive populations. But now there's mm -hmm. only a very small amount of them in the wild, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, Borneo was one of my target places to go to. Yeah, that'd be real cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. All right. So, so far, you've mentioned twice that you've almost died. Can you uh, tell us how many times have you almost died from, you know, herping in the wild, and then also give us at least one full story of how we the world almost lost. <laughs> Dave Coffin. <laughs> when I was in, uh, this is back in uh, the late 90s, I was volunteering on the sea turtle research beach that I was talking about. Okay. And I actually have a novel coming out. Well, so it was supposed to go to print already, but we're having a page count issue. Um, and um, so it'll, it'll go to press, press, press. Good, Dave, good. It'll go to press pretty soon here. Um, but it, it's, it's a novel that I wrote based on this true story. Uh, we, should, we put, should we put spoiler real quick? But <laughs> uh, No, no, because I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase the story. Um, <laughs> they, on this beach, it is legal to harvest turtle eggs, and it's one of the only places that it's legal to do so to this day. Um, and there's a bag limit, whatever, and it created harmony between, you know, the conservationists on one side saying zero eggs and the poachers saying, screw you, we're going to take all the eggs. Mm -hmm. So this, now there's, there was harmony. Well, back then, um, the townspeople and the, the researchers that I was down there with were clashing because a little mob kind of formed that uh, wanted to take all the eggs. Um, and so they burnt down the research facility. Um, they beat up the researchers. It was, it was a mess. So when everything seemed to calm down a bit, I went on this national campaign to raise money to buy power tools, to buy you know, materials that we have here in the U.S. that they can't readily get down there. And I literally put them all into boxes, checked them as my luggage, um, and, and brought them down there. And then uh, for a couple of weeks, we every single day, we were building something different to rebuild the, the research facility. Well, as soon as we started rebuilding, we were getting dirty looks from all the townspeople, from all the people in the village. And yeah, I thought, okay, so we're foreigners. Well, no, that's not what was happening. Uh, what was happening was the fight wasn't over. And so um, they all got together and one day we're at the burnt out facility rebuilding and uh, they surrounded us and they surrounded us with machetes and one guy had a pistol and we're, we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, there, there's the, the 
one police officer that was in the village was with the mob that was accosting us. Ah. Hmm. And so we were armed with step shovels. We were armed with nothing. And they were charging us with their machetes. Um, and they, um, they held us captive in the ruins of this uh, facility for hours. And there was a mangrove swamp on the back uh, property of the research facility that one of the researchers that I was with got out. And she ran to the next town, which was 15 miles down the road, so that she could call the federal police. And so uh, after about six hours of us kind of like in this Mexican standoff, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this scar on my forehead, but one of the guys came up to me with a cinder block, smashed it over my head, um, and uh, I put him on the ground. He later got up and left the party. Um, one of the other volunteers, um, uh, he, I think they... I, I think they cracked his uh, uh, bone in his back. I'm not sure, uh, but they they you know walked up to him and smashed a cinder block over his head. The researcher went out there and uh, they took a log and broke it over his head. Um, and I was like, this is this is this is where you die. And no one is ever going to know what happened to you. No one is ever going to. You're going to be buried in the forest. And the people that I'm leaving behind will never ever find me. They will never have any closure. Um, so all of a sudden, after after this happened, and I was like, all right, so if this is where I'm going to die, I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to take you with me. And I'm not going down until you guys are on the ground bleeding. I'm not going down until you fuckers are, are going with me. And that includes that guy over there chopping at a tree with a machete constantly pointing at me, saying in Spanish that I'm next. And um, so anyway, these two white Suburbans or SUVs, I don't know if Suburbans were around back then, they pull up honking their horns. And it's the OIJ, which is the equivalent of the FBI in, in, in Costa Rica. And they pulled up and we literally, they opened the doors. We literally jumped in the vehicles. The vehicles took off um, before we actually had the doors closed. The entire village charged them, breaking out all the windows of the vehicles, um, smashing the vehicles with rocks and whatever. And when we left, we left the area within inches of our lives. If they wouldn't have been there, we would have all been murdered. Wow. And so we had to go spend the next couple of days down at the OIJ and, you know, give our statements of what happened. All of my luggage, you know, my video camera that was broken when I was hit over the head. All of it was was um, back at the facility, and that night, one of the guys from the OIJ had to sneak into the village to go to the little cabanas that we were staying in and take all of our luggage and whatever, and and bring it to us. And I've never been back to that little town since. And I think that I'm going back in October for the first time since that happened. That uh, is yeah. a crazy story. Twenty years. So that's that's one story. So that's yeah. essentially the, the fight that we, that, that um, happened before I was there, the fight that happened while I was there, the fight that happened afterwards is what my novel is about. Wow. So it's called Elysium Coast. You ready for it? Yeah. Sneak peek. Oh, snap. Wow. So that's, that's coming out uh, God knows when. <laughs> That's great. Dave actually wrote a book to name the same thing already. That's that's nuts. Really? <laughs> no. Really? <laughs> no. I want to read your look. James signed copies. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'll send you my copy sign. You send me your copy. <laughs> that's oh, Dave just hopped off. I don't know. Hey. How... Um, Dave, I was joking, dude. Dang, he's very emotional. <laughs> he's... You know what? I think during that whole thing, he was frozen. I think he lost. We lost. No, no, he, he just was... doesn't blink. He, it's fine. He's actually he he does that sometimes. <laughs> oh, he, um, yeah. uh, he he blinks like he he doesn't blink. It's funny. He's right. yeah. um, I'm actually wearing these sunglasses because all that talk about blinking last week. I felt <laughs> <See>? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a smart move, my man. Smart move. It's funny. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that that's a crazy story. I yeah. uh, 
I expected like, oh man, I turned this rock and I got bit by a snake, and nope. No. I my footing on a cliffside looking for rattlers, and I almost California, but I didn't hold that. Um, no, I when I, I when I hear about a story like that, I God, I don't know, guys. I I, I just spring into action, and I don't think about the fear. I don't think about what, you know, oh, well, now if I do this, then maybe I'll be endangered. I don't think about that. I think, okay, this is what we're doing, and that's gotten me in a lot of trouble. But it's kind of how I think. You know, I hear there's a problem, and I want that problem solved immediately, and I want to do what I can to solve that problem. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I to be honest, I'm surprised I'm still sitting here. <laughs> but I, I'm, and, and to be honest, when I was in Ecuador, uh, I saw a lot of the, uh, the the rainforest destroyed for date mine, or date, uh, date palm plantations. And I want to attack that. With C4? Or like. <laughs> no. Uh, I want to investigate it a little bit further before I. Let's not tip anybody off. It. It's between me and you. We'll talk later. It's fine. What's up, what? <laughs> it's, it'll be between me and you. It's fine. We'll talk later. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I saw a lot of the rainforest destroyed, and all there is is date palms for as far as you can see. Yeah. And and I'm not happy about that. It's out of control. Like yep. the, gov the governments and the big corporations, like fighting against them, like you're yep. losing ground every two seconds. You know? Every two seconds. And, 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 you know, I always say that sometimes conservation work is like shoveling shit against the tide. It is. It's, yeah. it's, it feels like a losing battle sometimes, yeah. but but it's it's a it's a battle that I will fight until my dying day, especially when it comes to, to reptiles. Yeah. At the very least, you can slow uh, the demise. You know what I mean? Get exactly. You know, I mean, in my own lifetime, I have seen the my boyhood places where I could go and 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 see frogs and toads and garter snakes and everything just everywhere monarch butterflies everywhere mm. are now condominiums and you know places in the world that i've gone the red sea you know i went there for the first time when i was 13 years old starfish everywhere sea urchins you know you could go snorkeling and, and tiger sharks were swimming around i mean it was it was the most beautiful place in the world flash forward 20 years i went there and it's a graveyard you can see a parrot fish, maybe. Hmm. So I'm watching all of this happen within my lifetime, and I just can't sit and do nothing. So what? So, so in your opinion, what can we do? Like, what if if everybody listening here is like, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> you got to do something about this. You what, know, what's the plan of attack? So everybody asks me, well, everybody tells me that I want to do something, but the problem is too big. And it's like, yeah, you know, a, a pizza this big is going to be too much to eat in one sitting. Take little bites of the pizza. Everybody takes little bites of the pizza, the pizza is going to go away. So when it comes to conservation work and when it comes to what the individual can do, hang on a second, <coughs> um, and what the individual right. can do, I'm trying to quit smoking and I'm doing this and it irritates me. Um, but uh, when it comes time for what the individual can do is find that something that you can do, that you can control. Find out where you can volunteer and take little bites and concentrate on that little bite. And therefore, you know, the entire problem that we're all facing doesn't become so overwhelming that you're just like, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So find that niche and make your difference. Yeah, if you look at it all in a big picture, you could get frozen with just the, the size of the mountain in front of you, you know what I mean? I was, was for a long happened. time, yeah. Yeah. Like, you just like the what the old saying is, act locally, you know, think globally, act locally. Exactly. You can change exactly. something in your backyard, you probably can get that done. And if we all change something in our backyard, it's all changed. But also, you know, Look into all the things that we are doing that we think that we're being environmentally friendly over. Um, you know, this thing with China, 
and this is this is this isn't what's happening, you know, on a on a global level. But when you recycle, especially cardboard, you know what happens to that cardboard? A lot of it is recycled into other cardboard to make other cardboard boxes, so they don't have to deforest and, and make cardboard out of new materials. But a lot of that is sent to China, and China recycles it to make boxes to send more crap that has been destroying the environment back over to the United States. So mm -hmm. when people think that they're recycling and it's a good thing, you know, it kind of depends on where you are, but it's not enough to break down your boxes and put them in a bin. Do the invest, you know, investigate where, when they, when they bring that truck to pick up your recycling bin, where is it going? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you kind of have to look, like we said, beyond the headlines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I have usually I'm this really goofy guy, and all of a sudden this interview is like, and Dave also, you know, <laughs> Dave brought down the interview again. Yeah, and I'm going to blame Ryan. Everything Ryan has said so far has been sad. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of me talking about a puppy. But, Listen, uh, Ryan. All Ryan's fault. <laughs> we got a little crazy last time. You know, you're dressing up like a red tail hawk and all these things. It's fine. I'm trying to. That was the last. The last... That red tail hawk? And... Oh, yeah. That was last. I'm week. trying to bring it in. I'm... I apologize. <laughs> this is the biggest celebrity we've had on the interview so far. And I really want to hard hitting question. He already had his one kiss, but we can't do that anymore. Yeah. You know what's funny about that? When people say that sort of stuff, like I'm this big celebrity because I have a YouTube channel with it, I, 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 it doesn't make me like uncomfortable as it used to, but I just, I see myself as this doofus from Minnesota that happens to make videos. I don't really kind of. And that, that's exactly what I tell people too. <laughs> yeah. When they're like, hey, you, you talk to, to, to Dave, you I'm like, you're you're from Minnesota, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about Dav? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> towards Jesus, David. Yeah. That's awesome. That's funny. So I don't want to be a downer anymore. Anybody else want to jump in here? Like I'm drowning. <laughs> all right. So what's all right? So what's what's your uh, top two places that you want to go next? Like the top two that you're like, all right, Madagascar and Borneo. Madagascar and Borneo. That was pretty quick. I feel like you've done this interview before. I, I, have a I feel like you're asking all the typical I interview know. questions Dave gets. What's that? I'm saying you've already heard all these questions before. You're ready to go. We're just yeah, right, right. We're right. Taking the same information over again. Yeah. Uh, I do want to go to India um, because that is the safest place that I can go within the leopard geckos range to do leopard geckos in the wild. Mm. The west coast of India would be amazing. Yeah. I hear I hear leopard geckos have a really bad bite though. You got to be careful. <laughs> gotta watch out for leopard gecko bites. These 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 hands are every scar on these hands is a is a trophy. <laughs> I watched this uh, uh, nature documentary, a travel slash nature documentary about the the west coast of India, and they showed the uh, rainforest jungle where you can go up in this tree hut, like tree fort or whatever they have. 50 foot up in the air in the middle of the jungle and they just leave you there and you can hang out for a week like a hotel room. They're like, you go down to the ground level, there's like king cobras and all these other crazy crap going on. And I'm like, that's how I want to spend my week. Like, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> well, if I'm going to do leopard geckos, I got to go to the desert, but yeah, well, you can swing by the jungle. <laughs> there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a small town in, in Western India that I heard about that is completely overrun by monkeys. That sounds yeah, about right. I've got to go check that out. I've got to go check that out. Monkeys are – they they could be tricky. I'd be careful. Oh, <laughs> that will be your new death right. story, monkeys. Yeah, Mon monkeys. Yeah, well, your death. monkeys, macaques. I haven't seen any great apes in the wild yet, but monkeys and macaques and I, uh, we just don't get along. <laughs> My grandmother used to have a capuchin monkey, and he, yeah, used, to, yeah. he used to pickpocket me all the time. Right. A little kid. Right. Right. It really would. It would pull my wallet out or it'd take my watch off my wrist without you noticing. Like, seriously, yeah, my, it was trained us. first trip to Thailand, there was a uh, a troop of macaques that, yeah, thought that they were free to steal stuff from me, and I went and got it back. <laughs> you left them on the ground, too. What? <laughs> you left them on the ground, too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which was funny because I was like, I can't hurt these guys. But I, I kind of need what you stole back, so I would never, I would never hurt them anyway. But you know, 
don't know. They're just they're, they're they're too much like me for me to. I don't know. I was going somewhere with that. I completely lost it. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, That's all right. <laughs> Dave. What else you got? Just Dave. Yeah, other Dave. Other Dave. Um, I don't know, man. Um. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank right now. This is I'm struggling today. I think it's this heat. Get all that sun on me right now. You know, you know what time it is. Dave, What's you know that? what time it is, right? We is call- it that time? It probably is. Because I thought we agreed only people from other countries. What? To talk about oh 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 right. I mean we could we could be typical and just keep this going while it's still relevant if you want to keep it going, Ben. Might as well. Oh, yeah. Might as well. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Ben. This is your favorite part of the show. Let's hear it. Not my favorite. What did you think about Tiger King? Let's, let's talk Tiger <laughs> King. We're talking Tiger King, folks. <laughs> so, yeah. Me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah not me. We already know what I feel about it. I'm thinking whoever the higher power is that everybody goes to to think that it wasn't about reptiles. <laughs> could have hey, easily it's so hard, it really could have. Oh, yeah. It would have been a hundred times worse, I think. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Dave? Here's, you know, you're the guy for this question. If that documentary went as planned, um, which was all about, I believe, selling venomous animals within the community and yeah, just yeah. how irresponsible we are, yeah, it do was, you uh, think that would have been aired on TV or anywhere? Or do you think it would have been a non-existent documentary for people watched? I don't think as many people would have watched it. I think it would have been, you know, one of these documentaries out there that is exactly like every other documentary of that genre out there. What made this kind of go beyond animal people was the characters involved and the murder mystery. And, you know, this guy got two straight guys to marry him for meth. And, you know, all the, all the, the just the craziness of the people that, that, that show had nothing to do with the animals. The animals were a secondary character. It was about the people. They are absolutely that shit crazy those people are. <laughs> and and that's what made it the phenomenon. So and the and the tigers were secondary. So I think that if it would have been about people selling ven- venomous animals, it would have been more about the venomous animals than the crazy people doing it. And I, I, I don't think it would have been the phenomenon that it was what about if it had good music like like the tiger king well that's <laughs> i mean would it have ended with a fat guy on a on a skidoo that was the best part of the <laughs> yeah thing. yeah people yeah. talk about I mean, that part i don't even understand what the hell happened, happened there <laughs> <laughs> like i think was that under contract or that guy's like i'll do everything as long as it finishes with me on a jet ski it could be that yeah. was the exclamation point at the end of the sentence it's but, like it's crazy, it's crazy, crazy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know what that was? I think that was to kind of calm you down a little bit because if you didn't do that, I'm not really sure what I would have done for the rest of the night. Like I might have been enraged for the rest of the yeah. night. For all I know. Yeah. I'm so confused. When I watched uh, that, right, scene, so, on this note, did Carol kill her husband? Absolutely. Yeah. Unquestioned. Did? Yeah, actually. So we play a different game on here. Um, it started <laughs> last week. Dave, you're um, it's your turn. Um, Mary, fuck, kill. Carol Basket, Doc Antoinette, Joe Exotics. Kill them all. <laughs> there you uh, go. We're top I mean, this, man. Come on, man. No one's gonna judge you. You can say you'd sleep with one of the guys and you're not gay. It's fine. I already did say that. Yeah, but even if I was somewhat attracted to men, it would not be those two. <laughs> no, not even Doc. No. Doc no. will take care of you, man. Doc, Doc would take, take care, care of you, man. He yeah. would take care of anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'd have to kill them all. Uh, <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Yeah, that's I don't know. Know. Carol, Carol, Carol. She, she has money. All well, right. her husband has money. Both of them. <laughs> Wait, what is it? Kill, fuck, or Mary. set or set free in the wild? What was it? <laughs> set free in the wild. <laughs> Kill, fuck, set free in the wild. Um, you know, I'll let you slide and let that be your answer today because you're still gonna have to have sex with one of them. <laughs> Carol. 
Ah, you set Carol free in the wild? What? <laughs> okay. So, um, now kind of pick, I mean, the, 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 the choices are not, you know, pretty good choices. Yeah, that, that's, that's the game, bud. It's horrible choices. <laughs> that's the best you thing know, about I, it. I don't think I, you're I, would kill, I would kill Joe Exotic for the one reason uh, of, did you guys see the, the, that interview, that yeah. episode? Where they yeah, talked the about one. the horse, and he told yeah. the woman that he would care for the horse, and then shot it in the head as soon as she left. Yeah, that fucker's a dead man for that, right, right, right there. So, is That's that rough. true though? Which is the problem with everything about this whole series? Because I believe employees afterwards said that that animal was injured when it came there and had to be put down. I don't know. I saw somebody make a post on Facebook, so it has to be true. Well, there you <laughs> go, folks. That's true. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. yeah. That's, you win. <laughs> going back to my question about did carol kill her husband i i had my doubts until she said you have to put what, what was i gonna do put sardine oil on him that's the only yeah, way you could like oh dude you just gave yourself away right there that's exactly yeah. how it happened too Yep. Yeah, we are going to have to get a sardine sponsorship on this show because this is four out of five episodes. We've talked about sardine or sardine juice on this episode. Well, or on this, series. this video is brought to you by sardines. So. Yeah, it's got to be at this point. And honestly, ever since junior, I feel like we've talked about sardines every single week. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. This is not a joke. Sardines Every are relevant. <laughs> well, now you, now you have to see how long you can keep that going, but keeping it organic. I don't think it's going to be difficult. <laughs> how hard it is to get organic sardines like, what what, what? <laughs> so never mind <laughs> uh, about the dead puppies uh, no we're done with dead puppies Ryan come on we talk I'm about just trying to ruin such a bus kill dead puppies. <laughs> so Dave um, you know you do a lot of shows like me and I know everyone kind of brings something else to the table um, whether it's camaraderie or the animals you see what's your favorite big show to go to Tilly. Okay, and is that for the animals, the camaraderie of the whole weekend? Just what is it about that show you love? I is it Portillas? It, no, we have that up here in Minnesota now. Oh, um, excuse me. <laughs> and we have uh, Giordano's Pizza now. One of the Chicago pizza places that I used to go to down there, we now have here. Wow. So, um, no, it is. It, it is. It is exactly that. It is. It's. It's. It's nice. You know, it's nice and carpeted. The booths are nice. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it, it's the people. And that's that's what I'm going to miss most about 2020 is that the reason I love Tinley, the reason why I love, you know, Pomona, um, and the reason why I love these expos is because it's the one place that I can go and see all my friends from all over the place, and it's one big party. And... And I'm going to miss that this year. I really am going to miss that this year. But why Tinley again? It's just it's the it's the nicest expo there is. You know, Brian and Bob. Just I can't say enough good about them. I love them both. Um, I <clears throat> sponsor that expo, and uh, I uh, it's it's just it's 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 the big it's the first big show that I was ever at, and I think that that has a lot to do with it too. But it's just the nicest show. You know, Daytona. It's in this big hall, um, you know, and, and, and that's fine. But, you know, I kind of like the aesthetic look of Tinley. Hmm. And I guess I that's, that. yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm the same boat. I have more friends at Tinley than any other show in the country. Right. Um, you know, there was something about Pomona. It felt like people were just really happy there. It felt a little drama-free, like no chaos, and that was the last Pomona show I went to. Just everyone seemed just very chill. Were you uh, at the like, January one? I can't remember. They all blend together now. They always blend together. Yeah. I don't. I missed the last two Pomonas. I think it was the it one was, okay. that, that I went to. I believe. All right, because the one that you and I were uh, chatting at at your table there, that was. I think that was three Pomonas ago. It's been a yeah. while because I always talk about going and then I don't go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a hell of a drive. It's a hell of a drive. An amazing I, drive, though. I love driving across the country, um, personally. Yeah. But now, I don't have to elaborate on that. That said, I just like driving across the country. <laughs> right. What? It makes sense. Right. Look at you. 
<laughs> what, what am I supposed to keep on talking about the United States right now? What do you want out of me? That's it. America. Come on, I'll do this and you talk about it. America. America. When you drive across the Grand Canyon, <laughs> near the Grand Canyon, I'll... across. Okay, so, hey, Dave, when you're driving, man, I mean, are you like me when the sun just starts going down? I mean, are you looking for random roads to just start cruising on any road trip you're on? No matter or where I am, road? absolutely. Okay. You ever, ever accidentally come across that special road? Because oh, I spent yeah. a good year last year, and I don't think I found shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. Right. Actually, we, we, we were in the Badlands. And there's, there's not a lot in the Badlands. You know, there's kind of the same stuff we have here in Minnesota. There's the hoggies and the bull snakes and the whatever. But, you know, we don't have uh, Virtus over here, you know, Western rattlesnakes. Um, and so, yeah, we were – there was like – it was just absolutely magical. The sun was going down. This prairie thunderstorm was coming over the horizon. So you had the sunset over here. You had, you know, lightning and thunder over here. It was just beautiful. And we were like, it's going to be salamander heaven. And back then, there was a subspecies of the tiger salamander called diaboli, which were the, oh, crap. What were the diaboli? Does anybody remember the gray salamanders? Somebody out there knows. Anyway, but, you know, now they're the uh, uh, into the into the tigers but yeah we found this one road we knew that that thunderstorm was going to bring out everything and we found western hog noses at night in the rain which was bizarre bull snakes crossing the road at night in the rain more rattlesnakes than i could count and then we went down this other road and we actually had to turn around and get off the road because there were so many salamanders we couldn't drive through it wow, wow. we were afraid we'd crush them all so yeah yeah, that road stands stands out the most out of that. But then, you know, if you're in Arizona or whatever and you see that sun going down, yeah, find that small little, you know, road that doesn't have a lot of traffic, something's going to be crossing it. Mm. We got to do that. Oh, I'm having technical difficulties. I'm going to check out again and come back in. Give me three seconds. Did, did you hear what I, I said? You didn't even hear what I said. I heard it. <laughs> you know, He'll have to he'll have to watch this again if he was having that's right. That's right. <laughs> so um do you uh Dave's back on, hang on. Back. What? All right. Do you, so did you hear him paint that whole picture, Dave? Um, so here's the sad part. Um so Dave, do you know who Mac Robinette is? Who? Um, he's a breeder down in North Carolina, a good friend of mine, really good friends with Limey. I didn't hear, um, I didn't hear the name. Oh, Mac Robinette. Maybe. Sounds he's old, he's an old school guy. Well, um, that son of a bitch just called me three times. And when I get a phone call, it completely <laughs> ruins the volume on my phone. I missed that entire story. And I also missed the entire story about where I think you had a brick against your head. Oh, <laughs> somebody stop. called me in that moment too, and everything was silent, and I couldn't hear anything that entire time until I had to sign back in. So, um, so yeah, Matt Robin and Matt for two hours, hours on this one, which is awesome. We can go another two hours if you guys want. <laughs> Not well, my batteries are off. The next hour and reiterate the story. So there I was in <laughs> oh. on the beach, <laughs> totally naked with a no. mark. I can't believe that, you missed that. Is that it? Is that, are we, that are we, are the brick that hit him in the head was a brick of cocaine. It was yeah. <laughs> okay. Time. Yeah. So it was a party story. I missed the party story. You know party story. that Costa Rican women are very different than American women. <laughs> no, our, this is being recorded. You can go back and listen to my story. <laughs> yeah, uh, just like you, buddy. I don't listen to my stuff after it's done. Yeah. What is that about us? Why don't I? I yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, the random shit that comes out of my mouth, I'm afraid if I listen to it, I'm going to try to straighten my game out. I don't want to <laughs> I don't want you guys to get a lesser version of me when I realize how fucking stupid I sound when I re-listen to it. <laughs> so, I just think it's better off I don't ever listen to these. <laughs> uh, you're right. Right. All right, so to paraphrase, I was fighting poachers on a sea turtle research beach in Costa Rica. 
They trapped us in the ruins of the burnt out facility that they burnt down. And they, and during the fight, I took a cinder block to my head. Lots of fisticuffs. You know what? We're going to, you're going to have to tell me that story when we hang out, when you don't. Fist yeah. 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 Let's do it and I'll tell you that story. Well, by then the novel will be out and you can just buy the novel. For I consider it. I consider it. <laughs> it's going to be fifteen bucks to everybody else. Are you? That's, that's, that's affordable. Is that a paperback? I take it. Yeah. yeah. Hardcover. Yeah. Are you? Are you the voice on the audiobook? Did you do the audiobook? I, I am. I'm trying to find. I, I, I'll probably do an audio voice, but I, I'm trying to find the perfect voice to do it. In. Okay, that's because. Awesome. I wasn't going to say, but I mean, your voice is real soothing. You probably put me to do sleep. I'm just saying do right this or do I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or do I just use my... Actually, this isn't my normal voice. My normal voice is kind of like this, but, you know, I kind of tone it down a little bit. Just, you know... Yeah. yeah. No, I probably will do an audio book, and I probably will be the one to read it. I, I actually enjoy audiobooks to have the author as the, the speaker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I, and I have plenty of friends that have recording studios that, you know, I can just say, hey, here's a rattle on bracelet. Let me have four hours in there. Yeah. <laughs> when you do your book on tape, I'll listen to it on one of my road trips. How about that? There it is. There it is. No, I've got to figure that out because one of the things that I'm going or that I don't know now, I'm not going to say definite that I'm going to do anything. But before, when I got back from Australia, I was going to launch rattle on media which was going to be a multimedia company that was going to encompass my YouTube channels, any other films that I do, and a publishing arm to it. Um, and this is going to be the first book through that publishing arm. But now, you know, back in March when you made plans, it's not the same as making plans now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do it. It just all depends on when. So right. I don't want to be caught in six months and be like, Man, if only I didn't start that company six months ago, I'd be in this position or whatever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wait a bit. I'm gonna wait a bit. And if there's no expos that you know happen this year, I don't want to launch the book and then just have them sit in storage or you know sell them online or whatever before I can you know roll it out at an expo. And I wanted to roll it out at Tinley, but we'll see. Everything's up in the air. I get that. It is. Yeah. 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 So, so well, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, you know, I didn't know how much time you had, Dave. I wanted to, you know, make sure that you're good. Uh, you know what? It's six o'clock on a Saturday night. If there wasn't a, you know, coronavirus thing, I'd be probably sitting right here. Anyway, <laughs> talking to me. Sun's okay. getting real low, big guy. Talking to me. <laughs> By myself. <laughs> no, I've got, I, I, how long do these things usually go? I mean, uh, if you haven't heard about the past two hours, I can talk all day. Um, well, we're not going to do this for two more hours. Yeah, um, right. I can promise you that. Um, <laughs> it's not true. It dip out I, randomly. <laughs> you know, Dave, in the past two hours, I've watched the sun just kind of move like across your face, kind of like yeah. a moon phase. This entire side of my body is going to get like a tank top farmer's tan, right, or this right, side is going to still be a normal farmer's tan after today. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, I'll pull it off. It's going to be a great look, but um, I think that's what's <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> But um, I don't know. Um, I mean, we could talk about some other herping stuff in the country. Um, I, I feel like we're forcing this right now. Usually we have a pretty good rhythm. You know, usually somebody says, you know, something special about who they're going to have sex with um, <laughs> on the show Tiger King. And we just kind of go from there for hours. And then there's some furry talk. Um, you know, well, no, so like, okay, how about this? What was your craziest thing you remember ever happening at Tinley over the years? Because there's always been something unique at Tim. Oh, Brian Potter taking a shit in a pizza box. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, Wasn't no, that Brian? I, I thought that was Kevin shitting in the box. Whoever's loaf it was. <laughs> I, I tell that story often. I yeah. did not hear that story. Wow. Uh, hey, you go uh, ahead and tell that story. You probably know it a lot better at, than at, me. A, at an auction. Uh, and, and this is maybe why I think you know Potter did it, but Potter comes out with this pizza box. He says it's a mystery box, and it could be – how long – do you remember how long ago that was? Ten years ago? Oh, it was at least ten years ago. Okay. So he says it could be, you know, the whatever was the $50,000 ball python at that time. Or, and he even said, or it could be a loaf of shit. 
<laughs> and people were betting steep. And I think, and again, it was a while ago, and I think it went for like $3,000. Wow. Right, Dave? Do, you, do you remember this? I remember this. Something, something. I mean, it went for several thousand dollars. So Brian delivers the pizza box to this guy. He opens it up. And yes, in fact, it is a fresh loaf of shit <laughs> that I always thought was from Brian. Maybe it was from Kevin. But yeah, the guy oh. bought a $3,000 loaf of shit in a pizza box. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we I started mean, going eight years ago. But, but that's the thing. <laughs> you can't really say, hey, is there a crazy story from Tinley and not have it come from the auction. Yeah, the auction is always a story that happens like on the floor. It's always at the auction. No, you're right. The, there's a lot of special happenings, but you right. know, there's also always a lot of good behind the scenes stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Right. The room parties. The room parties are always sometimes. Yeah. 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 I, well, I remember just for record, the room parties I go to are always fucking amazing. You gotta step up your game, Ben. You can't expect the party to happen. You gotta bring the party. <laughs> I uh, I've been to room party party in room party. Yeah. What was that, Dave? I've oh, seen... I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I've seen the pictures of Dave's room parties in the men's room. <laughs> oh, that's you know, more of a social gathering. Photo ever out of Tinley. Yeah, I did like the urinal one. You want to jump in a new one? We're talking about doing an over again. We could use some new asses. Nobody wants to. Well, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Somebody might. Um, you know, we joked around about this on the other one. Um, do you remember the pathetic display when we did the naked calendar and nobody wanted to buy it? No, I don't remember that. Holy oh, shit. So we get a we get 12 of us together, and you know, I think what like John Roberts, um, we had Adam Chesla was in it. No. Um uh, there was it was we had 12 random people that did it. Um and long story short, you know, we all had our own little table. We thought it was going to be awesome. It goes up there. We do a big slideshow to show off all the pictures. Yeah. And nobody fucking bid it on it. I, I think Marklin bought it for $200. And then I think someone like didn't hear the $200 bet and asked what it was up to. And he turned, heard it was $200. He's like, no, too, high, too rich for my <laughs> but, um, no, that was a lot of really depressed grown ass men that day that just thought that people would give a shit. But um, <laughs> I guess naked guys just aren't a thing in the hobby yet. You know, it's just That's it's not just not really? catching on. Is Somebody, it? Robin Marklin won that. Robin has it. I've considered to buy it back from Robin. Uh, right now. That's a mental you know, that was women, that thing would have gone for ten thousand dollars. Total sexism. Yeah. Maybe if we resell it off, it'll go for big money. Um, but yeah, it's just. Um, Fuck, man! The way this hobby is, I think half the people on that calendar aren't even in the fucking hobby anymore. Who? But um, no, yeah, that that was pretty disappointing. Everything yeah. else about the auction's been good, and all that stupid shit goes for big money. But well, that's what we about the auction. Yeah, I mean, look at Russ Gurley and his pies. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. Those 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 pies have you know paid for paid for a lot of retainers. Damn. Yeah, but. I think crazy. Um, yeah, the weirder the thing, like you said, the better the auction goes. I mean, I personally don't even donate animals anymore. It's either going to be something off the wall or nothing at all. Um, well, you know, I, I kind of got into the habit of when I'm in these other countries, like Ecuador or Australia or whatever, I will go to, you know, like art shops or whatever and buy something very unique from that country and bring it to the auction. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like when I was in Peru, I took a towel from the uh, Anaconda Hotel. And Bill Stewart bought that towel, and I think he paid a few hundred bucks for a towel that just said Anaconda Hotel. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of been my contributions to it. But I don't, I don't, I don't donate animals either, actually. No, it's, yeah. it's not that it's really pointless, but um, yeah, yeah, the animals never go for much, and we're all just trying to have fun. Nobody gives a shit about an animal. Right. 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 We uh we usually do the uh, gummy python, that big huge gummy python. Brian got that a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we we actually the last one we didn't do the big python because we were like, oh, is this like is it too much? Is it like we're doing it every year, kind of, and every time we do any auction. Yeah. And uh, one year, I forget who won it. Somebody won it, but this kid that worked, and I'm not gonna use any names or anything. This kid ended up befriending the guy that won and he got a big piece of it like this big and the gummy python is like you know you can't you can't eat an inch of it it's, it's just nuts and uh i just remember going down to the hotel lobby 
And this kid is hammered drunk, trying to eat the end of the, the gummy python. And it's like hitting them in the face. And I'm like, this is the most ridiculous thing. And right. then he's like, oh, that kid's like 19. And I'm like, Oh, this is his first Tinley, probably. Apparently, they soaked it in vodka or grain alcohol or something. <laughs> it got this out of hand quick. Of and, um, uh, yeah, that's one of those moments you're like, I remember that kid, and I'll never forget. Okay, so – um, Dave is not impressed with that story. Well, no, no, no. It's a great story. I just thought no, no, about no. Chase Baker because I know Chase Baker had a moment with one of those worms one time. And I've actually – now that you talked about it, I've woken up in a bed at Tinley – with that thing on me in the morning and no idea how it got there. Um, I don't even know if there's any pictures of it out there, but um, I'll talk to my buddy, Bill, but yeah, I woke up one morning with that thing in my bed and again, I didn't buy it. <laughs> I just remember Brian winning that thing and he ate maybe more than he should have. <laughs> yeah. I remember him winning it one year. Yeah. 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 It was That's so funny. Pretty, I don't know. They all blend together. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it, they don't call them gummy, gummy worms in Australia. They call them gummy snakes. I, yeah. I could just say snakes on it. I think I brought back a couple of those for the auction one year. I don't remember. I think I did. Did you bring any back this time? I don't think I did, actually. Son of a bitch. We, this, this last trip was, is seriously, I mean, from the time that we landed to the time that we took off. You know what? Here, I'm going to throw my phone over there. It keeps going off and distracting me. Um, so, yeah, by, from the time that we landed to the time that we took off from Brisbane, it was go, 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 go. So, yeah. So, I mean, how close did you get to a kangaroo when you were there? Oh, I petted him. Did you? Petted like him. wild kangaroo? Pet, petted it? Petted it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All you have to do is hold your shirt like kind of like this so it's like a pouch. And they think you're, they're one of you. So you just hold your shirt like a pouch and you bounce up to them and they just stand there. They think you're another kangaroo. Okay, Dave, because you haven't made a joke the entire time you've been on this podcast today. I can't tell whether or not you're serious or not. That's because I have this face when I just cracked that joke. <laughs> yeah. well, that, okay, so I no, shouldn't. Uh, that, I no, we, wild, we, we've, we've unfortunately hit two wild kangaroos with our car and destroyed the car. That was three years ago, two years ago. But um, the uh, uh, da, 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 da. the Australian Reptile Park near Sydney, um, they just have wild kangaroos that live in the park, and they're so used to you that, yeah, you can just walk right up to them, and they're just lounging in the grass, and you just pet them. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Do you yeah. ever have a fist fight one? No, not yet. Hmm. Not did yet. You, mm. Did you eat one? I did. What did you think about the meat? I haven't heard very good things so far. It was very strange. It was kind of like a cross between pork and chicken. Mm. That doesn't sound that bad. That doesn't sound that no, bad. It, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. But to it, it just it, being you know growing up in 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 this world where we eat pork, beef, and chicken, and maybe every once in a while venison. You know, having just because it's something that you're not used to, something that is exotic mm -hmm. to us, you know, it kind of puts you on that. So oh, I don't know about this, mm. but you know, Australians eat it all the time. I'm surprised it's not served at McDonald's, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it could be in the burgers, and they just don't know about it. Well, it could be, could be, but yeah, yeah, interesting. I have a uh, a side note. Robin Markland just texted me and said that. that uh, calendar, Dave, is hanging up in the Ship Your Reptiles office. Text him back and we say, I need uh, a picture proof. Picture proof. I'm convinced that thing is in a death drawer. <laughs> that's funny. That's very funny. Of course that's hanging in the Ship Your Reptiles office. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, hopefully he'll watch it and be like, oh, and then I'll, I'll ask him for a picture proof after. Yeah, I'm going to need that picture proof. That I'm going to have to buy it back from him because I kind of want it. We only did one copy of it. Oh, that was a mistake. Hmm. Yeah, big mistake. Who has the files? We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, uh, yeah, shit, I'll be honest. I don't have much more going on up here. I think it's going to be up to um, Ben and Ryan. 
I, I, I feel like I've contributed enough. You guys I, are all staring at me like I'm supposed to give more. Well, I uh, I think that uh, I think you know we've been going for a little over two hours. I think you know it's not a bad place to to call it. And um, cool. I just had I had one one quick question. Did you have another question before I get? I had one yeah. quick question. Uh, can you can you stand up and show us what you're wearing from your bottom half so that we all can prove that you're not wearing jean shorts because that's that's how everybody. <laughs> you, you ready? Yeah. Ready? Here it goes. I'm doing it. <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> so can you do it again but stop your huge penis from running into the camera <laughs> it has a mind of its own dude it owns me uh, uh, no, i'm i'm not wearing jeans wait, hang on a second how do we, wait wait there you go hey, hey real shorts good for you. You. <laughs> nice okay the, the viewers really wanted to know what are anymore that Ryan loved so much. And if I did, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're in a closet somewhere, I'm sure. But I'm going to find those, and I'm going to frame those for Ryan for his birthday. But if he watches this, then he's going to know it's coming. So <laughs> He won't watch it. Yeah, he won't watch it. Yeah. Yeah, he won't. Nobody, nobody watches this. Like, I, do, this thing. Yeah, I, I gotta go clean my bathtub instead of watching it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny all right well you want to take us out yeah I, I took i brought us in you want to take us, I brought I, us in oh well thank out. you so much for having us on and uh pleasure guys <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah we we really do appreciate you coming on and it's yeah. uh, it's been great i know that we don't really talk much uh before like we had a, a couple moments and um well, uh, on that on that note i just want to say this so i was talking with Costco, and <laughs> There was a day after Tinley, like on a Sunday after everybody. I know was what you're about to say. Go ahead. Yeah, and and he told me about this and what he said, and I was like embarrassed. <laughs> that was like the furthest thing from. I had no idea that that had actually occurred. And 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 I, Brian was telling me this, and I was like, oh my god. I'm an asshole. <laughs> I, and I was, actually, that's actually what he said that you were. So that's what you're right, right. Well, good. <laughs> but no, I mean, the Sunday after Tinley, everybody's exhausted anyway. Oh, yeah. So, no, to please do not at all <laughs> take that. No, 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 no. So, Dave, what we were talking about, at, we went to uh, we went to Portilla's and Cusco was there. There's a bunch of people there, actually. Miguel was and, there and Cusco and yeah. yeah. And uh, so we're sitting down, we're eating, and, and I just happened to be directly across from yeah. Hoffman here. And I was like, oh, so, and I, I asked you something. I forgot. I was like, oh, so, you know, what did you think about something? And you, like, I connected with me and then just, like, turned and kept started talking to somebody else. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I was like, wow. I was, and I said something to Ryan. I was like, wow, that was pretty interesting. And, and no I had no idea that it occurred. <laughs> yeah, so we don't feel embarrassed at all because I do that to him all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, it's not <laughs> but Ryan's like, ah, oh, he's probably exhausted. Like, it's been a long time. And after Tinley, like, you know, it's busy and stuff. We're so I never really thought anything about it, but I always thought it was a funny story. Um, that was exactly what it was. And I, I was probably like, in my, my internal dialogue is go, going nonstop. I have to take my yeah. bullet and shut it the fuck up. But, um, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, Brian told me about that, and I was, I was mortified that, that, <laughs> That we had that exchange. That was it's so not like. Yeah, sorry. Next time we go to Port Fellows, we're going to talk about anything you want to talk about. I will let you buy me dinner while we're yeah. there. I mean, honestly. I'll make it up here. <laughs> so, um, for all the viewers out there, anyone who's ever had a similar experience with Dave, please in the comments let us know about how Hollywood he was and how he treated you like. Oh, man. We're going to add him up. We're just. <laughs> Yeah. If there's yeah. at least 15 of you, we'll start a Facebook page. I mean, I'd be like, oh my God, I got to call this person and personally apologize. I had no idea I did that. Yeah, we'll have a follow up episode where we have all those people on to yell at Dave. Yeah, right. Know, we'll we'll you really got their life ruined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, funny. so I, uh, formally, I apologize about there's that. There's no reason to do it. I'm yeah. going to have to cut that out. Great. Dave, your apologies for the apology episode, buddy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Fine. We won't have Dave back on. We'll have Dave. That Dave, because uh, there's no Dave on mine. So if you're talking about Dave, you're talking about that guy. Yeah, I should have been doing this the whole time. I feel like I really missed out an opportunity to like third person myself this entire episode. I we will have to do this again so I can remember that next time. Anytime you guys want me on again, I'm I'm there. Yeah. We'll do it. <laughs>
All right, wait a minute. Now I got to see what he's typing here. I was going to write Davis, but then it was like, eh, I was kind of losing the moment. So <laughs> I don't know where Brian got that, but it's kind of like. He said he was, he was still, you know, they maybe had a little too much to drink the night before and he was really tired and it just came out and he said, and it's stuck. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, well, isn't that how nicknames start? Yeah, pretty much. Somebody calls you something at six. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. well, thank you so much again for, for uh, coming on. And, um, you know, like Dave said, we'll, we'll try to do this again and we'll do like a reunion tour for, you know, whoever. If you guys want me on to sit and bullshit, I'm on. Maybe yeah. next time we'll do it in person out in the field. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Let's say maybe we'll interview on the, or we'll do an interview with you on the 15th at that virtual reality. Um, <laughs> How does that sound? 16. Oh, uh, we're going to be a day ahead. Yeah, I'll be a day ahead. I'm, on, I'm there on the 15th, man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're never gonna get this outro. Huh? <laughs> I know. Now you guys make sure you subscribe, like, and uh, hit that bell. And you uh, that, that, that was a scary <laughs> <film. That> was... <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much, and uh, you know we'll talk to you the next time. Thanks, guys. See you, man. All right, so we're out. So this isn't live, so you don't have to worry about, you know, we'll chop up the ends oh, and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave, you haven't sent me many herpin photos lately. Have you gone out? Oh, man. The weather here has been so bipolar. It'll be 30, 40 degrees one day and then 90 today. Um, I haven't really had a chance. I've been a little busy. We lost our employees because of coronavirus. They finally just came back. So Yikes. I'm under herp so far this year, but in about a week, uh, maybe a week and a half, my buddy's going to come out from Cleveland and we're just going to take a hammock and make our way across the entire state to all my favorite spots. Nice. So hopefully in about a week, uh, let's say in about a week, I'll have some good photos for you to look at, I hope. Awesome. I went out uh, yesterday, the day before, to a prairie area. I'm going to do a hog nose in the wild video. Nice. And uh, found a few, found a few, few bullies, garter snakes. But uh, all our stuff in Minnesota is down in southeast Minnesota, so I'm going to head down there pretty soon here too. Okay, so those videos were from our um, Minnesota. The well, no, the ones I'm about to make are. Okay. I can't travel, so I'm I'm going to do like all the Minnesota species that people keep. Straight so, like, roses and whatever. Yeah, I saw a dead um, Easter on the road the other day. It's the first time I've seen a dead one, I think, ever. Oh, uh, it sucks. Yeah, it was a real bummer. I said first dead snake I've seen so far this year. But um, no, I'm going to find some more time. I found some new tin down the road. I clipped the other day a bunch of ringnecks, milk snakes, and rat snake underneath it. Nice. Uh, snapping turtles are starting to wander. Snapping turtles are starting to breed on the property. Uh, great tree frogs, I think, are just about to start coming out. I heard them out in the woods today. Sweet. Uh, uh, bullfrogs just made their way out. I've been seeing them on the road at night if it rains. So it's happening here. The southern part of the state, people are killing it right now. But um, Yeah, I got a friend going down to Ozarks next week, maybe this week. Oh, good for him. Yeah, um, yeah. What park is he going to? I have no idea. Gotcha. No idea. I just know he's going down to the Ozarks. And, um, yeah, you know. What he finds is what he finds. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I'm going to try to get down to Oklahoma City in the next few weeks. I told you I got that great cruising road out there where oh, yeah. um, we found Massasagas, checkers, bull snakes, prairie toads. The list goes on. It was one of the best roads I've ever cruised. It's about an hour away from Mike Woolbanks and Bob Clark's place out in the middle of nowhere. Nice. But I'm going to try to talk to a couple of Texas friends to go meet me in Oklahoma. Sweet. Probably early June, I think. Sweet. Yeah, I'm uh, on a quest to find a bull snake in every state they exist. I am yet to find my Oklahoma bull snake. Really? Yeah. That, so when we ended up at this Oklahoma spot, it was, the goal was a Massasauga and a bull snake. Within the first five minutes on the first road, we found a Massasauga and a bull snake. Oh, nice. So, But yeah, we found two bulls and two Massasaugas cruising that road that night. We went back the next night, but it was a bit on the windy side. Not a single thing was out. Man, that's what sucks about like driving for 12 hours to get to a spot. And especially me where I need a video out of it. And if I don't find the snake, I, I don't have a video. 
Yeah. But even so, you know, you get out there and the weather like tanks, that's what happened almost the entire trip there is, uh, to Australia. Yeah. That's rough. Um, yeah, it's really rough. How yeah. did you, Junior, went to, what was it, South Dakota last year? Galewood? Mm, two years ago, maybe? Was it two years ago? I thought it was last year, but I could be wrong. All the years melt together now. Yeah, it really does, actually. Um, Once you get, like, over 30, like like me, all the days just melt together. All the years <laughs> melt together. <laughs> Yeah, fuck, man. I'm, trust yeah. me, I'm here. Um, I was not happy to turn 30 last year. Oh, yeah, but you look great for 30. Yeah. You don't, you don't look you. Nobody's correcting me. That's awesome. <laughs> if you want to believe you're 30, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, you get your ass kissed one time in this video, and that was it. So yeah, right, right. And there it was. We're not going to um, Why don't we uh, – why don't I do a quick little intro, and then yeah. – um, I can actually cut some of the stuff that you guys were talking about in if you guys want. I think that's it's kind of a lot of what I think we're going to be talking about, you know? Yeah. You want to just like fire questions at me or just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll do that. So let me, uh, let's do an intro real quick and then there'll be a cut. And you want to do the intro? Sure. All right. right. Are we allowed to call you uh, Davis? I was told, I was told by a close friend that to call you Davis. I know exactly who that <laughs> is, but that is reserved only for the Bryanists. <laughs> so no <laughs> <laughs>